Yeah. And our recording has started. Uh, you want to go ahead, Holly, and welcome people to day two, whatever. <laughs> Well, we, we all three can do some welcoming here. We really appreciate you coming back. Uh, and I think um, all three of us have heard from uh, a few of you uh, with mm -hmm. some questions, which is, is pretty exciting too, to see that you know you, there truly is some interest in, in our topic and uh, you're trying to figure things out. Um, I guess I would first like to ask if there's anybody who maybe has a question uh, that they'd like to um, offer uh, up about our Monday session workshop, if you would go ahead and uh, either type it in or, or go ahead and speak um, and let us know. We'll give you a, a few minutes for that, and then if not, we'll move on and start the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, everyone, you are, as I said before, you're all unmuted. Feel free to unmute and uh, chime in with anything you maybe thought about since Monday, questions that came up. Um, and let us know anything you were confused about, anything you wanted to know a little more about. We can expand on anything. We are not limited to just what we're talking about today. Today, <laughs> Ideally, between these two days, we want to get you all the information you need and get all your questions answered that we possibly can right now. To get you started. Yep. Yeah. I'm not seeing anything. Nobody's okay. attempting to unmute themselves, so I think we are probably good to just go ahead. Um, if you have any questions, type them in, unmute, interrupt as you feel the need, um, and uh, we'll be happy to do that. All right, so I just should we just jump on to the first thing? Well, okay, second thing on our agenda. Yeah, actually, I think you have to go through two. I've got one too many in there, but um, so yep. And, and we'll start um, just by saying today we're going to be talking about uh, um, E-rate category two because it it has a, a important function uh, and uh, relationship with your special construction category one. Uh, the fact that many libraries we've discovered um, are working with older equipment that uh, won't en enable that high speed that comes in with the fiber in your library to actually um, be allow for connectivity of that speed throughout your library. So uh, this is one of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, also, as promised, we have another library director from, and she's uh, Becky uh, Hinkle from Baird Public hey. Library, who is also a, a, a person who was a, a, Brave, yeah, <laughs> brave, and the library was a recipient for fiber. And um, we're going to go over online, just kind of run through a Word document, which is the RFP that the libraries used last year to submit their special construction category one um, 470 form. And Krista will go over through slides, kind of a step by step for through the EPC using EPC. Uh, what you need to do to submit your 470, which is the first step, really, besides the gathering that you're going to do. And I think you're probably seeing that from our uh, workshop on Monday and the, today, things that you need to gather up or think about ahead of time. But the actual submission, that would be uh, something that she'll be helping you with. And then we'll visit a little bit about last year's uh, recipients, all of them. Uh, there were some questions I've received about well, how much is this going to cost? Well, unfortunately, um, looking at the news that uh, is pr on the slide, it, it's all over the place. And there are a lot of variables that, uh, as far as the construction that can um, uh, make a difference in pricing. So, But we'll talk about that also. And then uh, Tom and Krista are going to highlight not only, you know, we were talking about special construction, and we think this is a great deal for fiber to the library. But we know that there's a, a lot of other opportunities for funding for things, and we're just going to highlight some of that um, at the end, and then, of course, questions and answers. So we're going to move forward and talk about uh, network infrastructure assessment for fiber upgrade. So first, before you can uh, probably uh, submit a, a Form 470 for Category 2 for equipment or services, 
you need to find out where your library is situated now. Um, some of you um, may have a good idea and keep uh, good paperwork on that, know how old your uh, equipment is, et cetera. But uh, for many, it's a closet that you don't like to go visit and that's okay. Um, you have somebody hired perhaps or volunteers to take care of that, but it'll be uh, very important for you for uh, making a decision to move to fiber to a, do an assessment of your network equipment. You can move forward. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is basically just copied right out of the off the website just to, to give you the, the, the full uh, amount of information related to what is category two. So it's the internal connections needed for managed broadband connectivity within your library. So that would be from where the fiber uh, comes in uh, from the outside is, is located on the outside and then it enters into your library and and wherever it needs to go. And, you know, it used to just be, well, um, we've got desktops that we need to service with this. Well, now you also have Wi-Fi and access points and uh, smart TVs and smartphones that are in your library. So um, this is managing whatever uh, types of devices that you may need to upgrade. And in particular, one that we've been talking about a lot is you may, um, have a firewall in your library now with a um, more like a home-based uh, Wi-Fi router. And we're really recommending, this is one thing I would strongly recommend, and, and I think um, Tom would too, because the schools use it, is that uh, you uh, have a separate device now that would be a firewall that would help uh, to manage any type of um, bad activity or anything that comes into your library. So this would, might be a new device for you. Uh, along with the devices, and the devices will be listed later that are actually in, in the PowerPoint, I'll list them and talk a little bit about them, that uh, qualify for E-rate Category 2 funding. Along with that, I believe that, you know, obviously USAC is understanding that you need somebody, a professional potentially, to come in and take care of um, getting you set up uh, to uh, use, you know, to in, in, in install and initialize and configure your equipment. And so with that, there are services that are also enabled to be supported through uh, funding. And you can see that in the, the, the second part of the paragraph. And on top of that, you are also able to have a, a managed internal broadband service. So somebody is keeping track of this externally and they're watching and seeing and they're managing uh, your throughput and, and how healthy your network is in the library. And that is also something that can be um, uh, put into a category two funding opportunity and leasing equipment and then also the uh, the uh, maintenance or um, whatever might need to be done with that leased equipment uh, within the library. So basically it's devices, network devices and services that include uh, installation, service and um, leasing of other equipment. Mm -hmm. And also, just to be clear, because you said the word devices, and I know there's lots of other funding in, that we'll talk about later that talks about covering devices as far as the computers, laptops, Chromebooks, whatever themselves. Those are not part of the eligible for E-rate discounts. They're so, kind of an end user device as opposed to, I would you know, refer to, you're right, Krista, as a network device. Right. E-rate is specifically for what makes the internet work in your building, not the device of the internet not the device that uses the internet. But there's other funding that's available to cover those if you need to update any of that. Um, and I'll also mention too, while you know Holly mentioned this is copy, you know, a lot of a lot of text here on these a lot of these slides, but just like on Monday, if you remember, we will send you this PowerPoint presentation afterwards. So don't try and scribble and write down everything we have on here. You're gonna have copies of this for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So you know listen, uh, take some notes about specific highlighting of things if you want to, but you don't have to try and write all this down. We're gonna send all of this to you afterwards. <clears throat> Next. So 
what can it do for my library? What can Category 2 uh, E-rates do for my library? Well, we've started this this year, this fiscal year for E-rate of uh, 2021 through 25. It's a, a five-year period of um, basically, I, I'm not sure if they even change the eligibility list. Do you know if they do that within that period or is it pretty solid? Yeah, can, yes, yes. The, phrase, the eligible services list is updated every year. But I couldn't, by the way, when we're looking at everything today, I couldn't find anything yet for uh, next year or the fiscal year 2022. So and that's, that's a little early, I think, for that. Yeah. Even though so, the, the form is, it's officially opened July 1st to start, but um, to, typically the eligible services list, which is the official list of everything from the FCC that you can actually apply for if anything gets changed, usually isn't finalized until like October, November. Right. Um, which so is why when I we look at the I, list. Yeah, you'll need to know that it's a 20 the the this this current year's list, and so uh, you'll we'll want to make sure that you have the the correct list. Well, it's pretty exciting actually what they've done for this five years. Um, they uh, used to um, the previous five years. Well, one year in between transition and the previous five years, they used the square footage of the library. Uh, multiplied by a certain um, um, amount uh, number and to determine what kind of funding you could have um, on an annual basis. Of course, it would be updated if you upgraded your uh, library, et cetera. But so now they've made a decision, and this is a pretty big number in my opinion, $25,000 uh, for a five-year period. So that would be for you if you were submitting a E-rate Category 2 request you would be looking at it and saying that if you're at a 80% discount for E-rate, that 80% would be coming out of that $25,000, and then you would be responsible for the remaining 20%. So uh, in a rural library, uh, from my experience in the last 10 years, um, that almost would be a challenge to be able to uh, spend all that money. Uh, so. Uh, I think you have ample money when you're considering what it is you might need to do after your assessment with your equipment to move into a fiber environment. Um, and it says here, this was just something I pulled off of a, a fact sheet, but basically any library uh, is, that's greater than the, the five, 550, uh, 5,555 square feet, you might then you would consider actually using the formula of multiplying your square footage by the four dollar and fifty cent amount because you would probably you would re be receiving more uh, money that way. So you do have a choice. So a larger library um, obviously would want to look toward that uh, type of equation to, to determine what their budget will be for the five years. Uh, I looked at well, what I thought was the number of the five 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 is just that's just how the math works it's yeah. the actual, yeah. it is actually the the, the budget is four fifty four dollars fifty cents per square foot of the library building and that just happens to come out to an even well about twenty five thousand yeah. at five 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 right 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 I think that it's that yeah. number <laughs> yeah and so um when I checked to see the participants in the workshop, um, there was no library that was, yeah, you know, we won't have anybody greater that. than that. And yeah. uh, <laughs> might be in your dreams, but uh, but I wanted to be sure. So so basically, everybody who's um, in the workshop today, you're at a twenty-five thousand dollar amount budgeted for five years, mm -hmm. beginning uh, this last year. That doesn't pe penalize you um, if you didn't spend anything last year, or if you wait until the last year. Um, I think that it is um, adjusted for, um, what's the word, inflation on an annual basis to that number. So uh, it will be adjusted. It's just not a flat amount. Um, so I encourage you to be uh, paying attention and, and thinking about this, whether you're doing fiber or not. This is a wonderful way to keep your library current and at the best speed, because many libraries uh, in Nebraska, or at least at, um, they're up to 50 megabits and using DSL, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but they would be able to uh, probably enhance their throughput in the library if they were to consider changing out some old equipment. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. 
Krista. Peggy, I see you've got your hand up. You have a question? I do have a question. Um, so is that like usable space in the library or does that include like our storage areas and things like that? It is um, all of the everything within the wall, the library walls. So okay. it's not just usable. No, if you just look at the library, where your walls are, how many floors you have, um, do the math. Okay. You might have um, paperwork or blueprints somewhere that tell you this, the square yeah. footage of the building. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And we have it self-reported in our Omni base from you all too. So yeah, I think it's something you uh, do on the, the public library surveys. Right. So that would be a number to use. Yeah. What I was going to share, the management of internal broadband services where you turn the device and its care into a negotiated service is a relatively foreign concept for Nebraska. So school districts are prone to buying the actual firewall and then the minimal maintenance and upgrades on that device over five years where they do it out of pocket. And then they configure and manage their internal wireless access points. With these kind of budget numbers, it really puts the library in a position to say, I don't want to do that. I could hire that out. As long as I can afford the post discount portion of that service on a monthly basis. But now your number is high enough that you're going to start to attract the attention of a small IT support firm that may work in your county, your municipality, or within driving distance. Mm -hmm. And then they can see and manage most of your devices remotely so they don't have to travel necessarily. And that may be attractive to them. But I'm just saying um, you're in that sweet spot to be able to possibly afford the management and then not have to ask a high school student or right. a spouse or cousin or whatever <laughs> to do this. And that's that's pretty novel. And I think sometimes, from my experience, a decade ago working with the VTOP grant, I would find a haggard um, IT or uh, tech support uh, school people and ESU people in the library working on a problem or doing something. <laughs> and so it would be nice, it would maybe infuse into your community some money too, uh, to actually <laughs> load business. off of them. Create a local business, you never know. <laughs> They have to have a spin number. Right. So they have to be a, a recognized service provider to get mm -hmm. the rate funding on there, but that's not that's a big step. Formality. For these yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, you know, as you can see, the next bowl is basically just a, we had a kind of, we sent out a report uh, or a survey last uh, year, small group of libraries, but enough to see that just to find out what type of net work infrastructure equipment, where you were in the purchasing of that. And I'm I'm just going to have to say, I think some of the libraries were fudging a bit because I know that some of them are still working with the same equipment that came out with the large last large infusion of equipment with the VTOP grant, which I think is now, we're at 10 years at least. And there's some are using the routers, the, um, the N version of the router, which is way, way overdue for a replacement. So one other interjection. Sure, you keep, you don't need to interject. <laughs> okay, you're so part of the com it's a conversation. <laughs> so in the world of DSL, um, if that's your internet service today, which would be you know under 50 megabits, let's say, you are of no use to a foreign nefarious actor mm -hmm. for taking over your library network, your devices. Yes, they could penetrate that, but your bandwidth isn't of any use to to them. They want a full fiber connection, like a school district, a large business, or whatever. So, and this is in no way meaning to scare you, but it is meaning to say, don't shortchange the sophistication of your edge device on your network when you get fiber, because all of a sudden they'll say, um, lead Randolph Public Library didn't exist before, but now all of a sudden I see it as a potential target. So that's where the firewall comes in, network security, and you'll be just fine, but you don't want to go into it saying, I'm going to buy um, or repurpose my five-year-old net, net gear router, or whatever. Mm -hmm. That simply won't uh, be sufficient, if that makes sense. And just to, 
to highlight um, for the, the libraries that um, there were six libraries that used special construction fund last year. And out of those six, four of them either had already been working with category two funding, as Cheryl said from Play Center, to prepare themselves for fiber, or this last um, year with the, the uh, filing and rece receiving the special construction, they also filed a category two uh, uh, RFP to be able to upgrade. So they're simultaneously doing this. So you have the option here. Um, maybe you're not quite ready. This is all interesting to you, but you might have missed your budget cycle or something like that at the at where you're at, where you need it. I think that a category two investment, number one, if you haven't done E-rate before, this is a good way to get started into that. Krista will help you. I will help you with the RFP that relates to that and get get set up for the equipment that you need to do for an upgrade and potentially look for upgrading to a point with your equipment that you're ready for your fiber. The other two are just, you know, kind of sh a little bit of shaming, but a little bit of excitement. If uh... <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I think we'll just move on. So the assessment options. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's possible your library or you yourself are, feel like you're knowledgeable with, um, about IT. I think the first thing I would do, and what I have done, because um, I, I would offer a service too, is generally because of COVID-19 restrictions, I've been asking, uh, I now know exactly what to ask for and how to take the shot, and usually are available to have it communicated by the library director, sends me a photo. I take a look to see what it is they are working with, with specific items. Sometimes we just have to describe the item because you have no idea what the box has in it or what the box is. So. Um, but you may have somebody on staff who can take a look at that and you or you yourself can go ahead and do some research. And, you know, I guess to me, if it's more than five years old, then it's, it's or four years old, it's on the suspect list to begin with. And so if it's older than that, you're probably looking at replacing if it relates to network um, um, trend, um, and connectivity in your library. So maybe you, um, your school district tech person, personnel, potentially, I know some libraries have a good relationship with them um, and would be willing to have them come in and talk to you. Uh, local school districts, ESU tech personnel would also be a good choice to have come in to visit with you. Uh, and if you're lucky enough, um, I would say if you have a contractor come in, but I would be a little wary, you know, you want to make sure and that you get their viewpoint on it. But my experience has been, it's been pretty much an overload of what they're suggesting that you purchase, but that's okay. Cause then we come back after visiting with me with something that might more likely meet their budget and, and be what, what, what it is they need. As I stated before, um, I'm happy to do that. Um, probably we would do it remotely, but I've done it with several libraries and it's worked fine. And then this is just a word of caution, but your current internet service provider uh, is somebody you can visit with about this. But in the light of the fact that you may be doing this and using E-rate, you wanna be sure you're just asking them, oh, can you take a look at my equipment and see, you know, we're thinking about going to fiber and we're just wondering, you know, what, what would your recommendations be for us? Um, you don't really wanna mention E-rate because it gives them a, unfair advantage of knowing something related to uh, your um, your your next move that would be to file for the, your category two for funding so should mention the toolkit yeah I wasn't I didn't have time to get out and take a look at it I think we'll have a follow-up email about yeah. <laughs> things that to, to talk about but yes yeah, yeah additional background for a walkthrough of your own equipment um, we were all, Holly, Christian, and I were involved in the formation of a, a toolkit in Nebraska is one of the pilot states uh, with uh, toward gigabit library initiative. So and that, that's available. Yeah, and that also, if you complete that, um, you can get um, continuing ed credits too, if you complete it and if you send the completed form into um, Holly with the I um, here that 
Holly Dugan, you can get some credit for that. I think it's really it's really well written. And if you are working with it, I would recommend your, I mean, you're welcome to give me a call if you get stuck or if you want to get started with it and you want to visit with me about it, I would love to do that with you. Um, like Tom said, we were the very first library that uh, worked with the Gigabit Library Group. There you go. <laughs> yeah, thank there, you. Um, I actually have this linked off of the E-Rate page that we have, my E-Rate website. Um, it's the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit, yeah, and this is just a great way to, if you don't know what's in your closet, like what you said at the beginning, Holly, you're afraid to look. <laughs> um, they can jump right to the section on, you know, internal devices kind of thing. So they don't have to do the whole and, toolkit. And this toolkit has been all over the United States. Um, it's amazing what they've done with it. And it's just for um, community libraries, just like what we have in Nebraska, more rural. This is not, you know, I know this is not for many of you, this is not your thing to know a lot about, but it's the way it, uh, it's very conversational. And again, if you get stuck with anything, you'd be welcome to call me and we'll send you this link. I have an email that will be coming out next week with a number of things to you that are registered for this workshop. And we'll include that there as well as, like Krista said, we have it already on the mm -hmm. e page. We highly recommend it. <laughs> So anyway, you have a number of people to work with to do this, um, mm -hmm. and there's no shame in what your closet looks like. Um, uh, you know, that's something you need to know too. Don't worry about it. They'll come in and they'll take a look at it, and um, you'll be able to have an understanding of where you're at. Um, so we'll just, I guess, we'll just move forward. Just want you to know that yep. it's it's okay. <laughs> and with school district personnel, you might want to offer chocolate chip cookies. Oh sure. You offer to <laughs> so always call in a favor when when you have an opportunity. So okay, we'll move forward. Okay, so here is the eligibility list of um, of devices that are uh, current were for 2021. So this will be coming out for 2022. Krista in, uh, indicated she thought it might be late October, November. That's when um, it has previously typically come out about that time. Um, I don't know that there will be much, um, I don't predict there being many, very many major changes uh, to it. Um, it's, there hasn't been any real, dis many, much discussion. Usually this is, there's a ahead of time discussion about, oh yes, they're gonna change something. Um, Years ago, they did do this. There was a major update, um, but since then, it's kind of it's the basics, and sometimes they tweak wording a little bit. But I would not um, expect anything drastic. Mm -hmm. And I and I think probably if you're not looking at uh, if you're not talking about it with somebody who is um, a vendor in your community, you. And if you don't know what some of these items are on the list um, exactly, you probably could just share that list with them and, and just ask them, you know, um, if, if you would uh, take a look at these things. One thing, let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five. I hope, and it, it's not necessarily network device, but I hope everybody gets some racks, let me just tell you. <laughs> That's the one thing I would say for a small rural library. Um, I'm always so pleased when I go back into a library and they've actually got a rack on the wall and they're utilizing it. And, and the equipment is so much, it's so much easier to work with. And one thing I will say, this doesn't necessarily have to do with fiber, but it has to do with internet no matter what. When you get a call or you call the internet provider and say, I'm having this problem, if you've got a, your equipment in a rack and you've got it labeled, um, it is so much easier to speak with them and for you to have a conversation and potentially fix it um, yourself with their assistance. Um, super important. Uh, but you see here we have the antennas. So at the top of the list, so this would be any of your uh, Wi-Fi um, access points. And this also includes, because I believe, I, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, it's attached to the building. The ones that are outside now, they can also, because it's physically attached to the building. So uh, mm -hmm. those those antennas are also a part of it. Cabling, um, we could talk about your ethernet cabling interior to your walls. If you 
um, have a history of your library and let's say in the last 10, 15 years there's been nothing done with uh, if you have cabling behind drywall or whatever in your walls, it would might be a good idea to be looking at replacing that also, Ethernet cabling. Um, the firewall, Tom talked about it, the importance of it, and um, I think that that's something that definitely would be part of a list for you. Racks, the router switches, um, the router, uh, you know, it could be that uh, whomever you award to would have a recommendation for a router, or they may actually have a router that uh, they would rent to you, but again, if you want to purchase it, this is the way to do it. Switches, if you, um, I know that we had gigabit switches uh, in the BTOP grant, but they would be 10 years old, so you may also want to consider replacing your switches, whether you want to use uh, a managed or unmanaged. I think, you know, the recommendation would be managed, and that would be great if you actually use uh, the service capability of, of having somebody managing you know, some um, some local person coming in and setting that up, that would be far superior. I'm having a hard time seeing some of this with the lighting. Uninterruptible power supply. Oh, that, that also is, in my mind, is pretty critical, and I'm sure you would agree that if you're buying this expensive equipment, you want to be sure that you, if the power goes out, that you can manage having it go down gracefully. Um, Every library that worked with uh, this fiber that had ordered and, um, and a, a UPS if they didn't already have it. Okay. And the wireless controller system, I've never worked with that. Tom has. Do you want to kind of highlight that? Not me personally, because it's a home network, but mm -hmm. every single school district manages numerous uh, wireless access points up and down their hallways and within every classroom. So libraries are just getting to kind of that uh, size of, do you, could you use one to cover every square foot of your library? Do you need one if you're multiple floor? Uh, do you have a dead spot over in the stacks or where the um, young uh, patron tables are or something like that? So that's part of the assessment is that you would look at the range of a wireless access point whether you need one or more, and the fact that those things uh, need to interlace with each other and then not have radio conflicted signals. So the more that you would put in, the more likelihood you would need a wireless control system so that you can see all the access points or somebody can see them for you and then help manage. If you can get away with one or one really high powered wireless router, in the center of your library, then, or your library is smaller, uh, then this may not be something you need to worry about. Yeah, okay. And then the software supporting components um, is for distributing throughout buildings. I don't think that that would really apply to a, li a small library. And then here uh, under the notes, it talks about if you have a cloud, if you're working with a, a cloud, uh, equipment in the cloud that it is also eligible, it has an eligibility for functionalities for certain <laughs> things. Um, but I think the one, the other thing here is that it's talking about is the manufacturer multi-year warranty. Uh, one That's one of the things sometimes I know some people want to think about maybe not uh, paying for that warranty, but it looks like it's also can be covered also, which would be a good thing to make sure because uh, if, if you don't have a warranty, and especially if you're in a rural area and that equipment is out there and you have to go through the purchasing of a new piece of equipment, if you could get a service person in, and that may be questionable too, but I know that with the computers that we had with the BTOP grant, we actually did have warranties on them and we did have uh, um, authorized um, companies able to come in and fix them relatively quickly. Okay, so here is the next slide. We want to talk about that at all? Um, we've kind of touched on this already, but uh, mm -hmm. the list in the prior slide was, I'm going to go ahead and go out for procurement or RFP or Form 470 for a specific device and then pay to have it installed 
and then may or may not be managed. You can turn the entire uh, procurement on its head and bid in parallel, let's make that a service. Therefore, I don't own the firewall. The company that provides a service will own it, upgrade it, maintain it, and be able to see my network from the outside. So it may be possible when you do your category two form 470 and procurement that you really look at it at two separate strategies. And I know that may be foreign to many of you uh, and also foreign to school districts because again, they manage their own, they only end up buying the firewall or the edge device and then the three-year maintenance package is bundled with that. So just something to keep in mind, Ollie and Krista can guide you when you get closer. Um, and it may be that you end up staying with the service you have and delaying your fiber construction by another year. You may also be able to delay a firewall purchase in parallel with that. Mm -hmm. But if you are 90% sure that fiber is going to be for you, July 1, 2022, then before February of that year, your category two procurement will need to be done and they'll be shipping you either a service or a new device for your library. So, all right. Well, the next, um, what I'd like to do next is just give an example of, um, I guess, I, I, let me step back. Um, with a category two, it's possible that you can file similar if you're familiar with category one and, and filing for uh, um, internet um, um, connectivity with a vendor with just a paragraph within the form 470. But what we'd like to do with the fiber um, option for libraries and category two funding, if you're looking at it is, and is to somewhat standardize what equipment is purchased across the state as much as possible. So, and in fact, trying to connect it up with the opportunity that if you have a local school or an ESU um, that is willing, uh, per perhaps they could also be considered somebody who could technically help you with that equipment. So for this last um, uh, round of uh, E-rate, we, use basically this particular, and if you want to go ahead and show it now, screen sharing, um, uh, RFP, uh, yeah. yeah. Do you want to share your screen now? Okay, right. hold on a sec. I'm going to make you a presenter. Okay. See the pop-up to show your screen. And then the Word document. There you go. Just need to get the one you want. The one, uh, that one. Oh, no, I don't have it up there. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm missing it. Um, uh, no, it's not that one either. Uh, okay. Let's see. It's uh, I think it might be uh, on the web. Let's go to the Chrome. Hmm. Right there, the multi-wheel. Take a look. Yay! <laughs> Third time's <laughs> a charm. You've previewed what's going to be coming up. <laughs> so basically, if you want to slide it over, I don't know, but more middle. But this is um, an example of equipment that. Um, Basically, it's an RFP that was used in two of the libraries. They basically needed the same type of equipment, um, uh, and we went with what the ESUs are currently using across the state. And um, first part is wireless access points. Yeah. So, is there another section? No, this is just. I just wanted to show you okay. basically if you're considering this. I want, I'm showing you this to show you that hopefully it'd be very easy. The, the top part is canned paragraphs, basically that just describe who you are and what, you know, what, what you're needing and what year you're doing your, um, your, you know, what year you're associated with, with the category two. And then the bottom half that Tom was scrolling through and talking a little bit about, this is the equipment that you're asking about. So when you're, when you're asking this, you know, and you send this with the 470, your reply will be might be more than what uh, you've just uh, itemized in here because the vendor may be saying, I've got this super list here for you. And what's great about that is then you can cherry pick what it is. They'll have the cost of it and you know you and the number of what you need. 
and then included in there because in the top paragraph you're saying I need somebody to install this also they'll include their cost for um, you know travel and installation of the equipment and setup of the equipment so it's really pretty simple assessment will be critical to you know making sure you get everything you want to have in your list before you submit your 470 and then when you submit the 470 I prefer that if you're at all interested <laughs> that you use this um, RFP and we we look to equipment that kind of matches with the school systems um, across the state and just a few words about that so Holly you put up here the wireless access points there are about five main families of equipment that school districts use they do not um, center in on any one of those consistently, but Ruckus is a competitor, Aruba, Ubiquity, et cetera, and we've got lists of those, and they're all good. It's just a personal preference. When it comes to firewall, which is not listed in this slide, um, over 90% of Nebraska school districts are using FortiGate firewalls, mm -hmm. and they are hands down feature over function and price everyone's uh, preference, particularly for smaller schools. And then our larger school districts, university, lean more towards Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. And that's regarded more as a premium product, right, yeah. uh, probably beyond our needs mm -hmm. uh, for what we're talking about mm -hmm. today. And we did purchase, um, they did, the two libraries did purchase a FortiGate firewall that mm -hmm. when they... Yeah. So. And Krista, while you're speaking, you should go into the or equivalent uh, portion of the form oh, course yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, can you, um, it, it is a, uh, and someone did just mention it's true. It is a little small on the screen there to see this. Um, can you, um, for the list, like zoom in a little bit up at the top there where it has the 81% uh, um, Yeah. Yeah. Right. You there can you be a little bigger. Yeah. Um, you'll also, you'll all be getting a copy of one of this as well. Um, we're going to be sending um, next week at some point, right, Holly? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, probably Tuesday yeah. or Wednesday. We'll yeah, you're all going to get a, um, the uh, template of this to, uh, for your own reference as well. Um, and I think so. I'll send a bid response also. I just didn't know how much time we'd have um, from, um, from one of the vendors just to give you an idea what you would receive back. Um, it, was, it was a bit complicated um, for the library to wade through it. Um, because they don't just send you just the facts. Mm -hmm. But one thing I did like about it is they sent for each piece of equipment, um, they sent a you know an informational page about it, which helps you to educate yourself about what it is you're <laughs> purchasing. Yeah, often in their quote, their bid responses to you, their quotes, they are um, trying to sell themselves. So right. like half of this like 20 page document is, here's why we're such a great company. That's fine, where's the details? Give me how much it's gonna cost. <laughs> right. So that wraps, and look, Tom, did you have something to say? No. Okay, um, that wraps up my portion of it. And I don't know if Becky's on yet, so. Um. She is. Um, Michelle, uh, Stephanie, did you want to ask another question? Um, I did. Yes. Yeah, um, I saw you had logged down and back in again, so that's why it was still muted on you. Um, Stephanie, you should be able to unmute yourself if you wanted to. That's perfect. Thank you. I just was yeah. looking to see the the wording. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yep. And Krista, you can take back control of the screen. Yep. I'm going to also do this. Get me there. And back to me there it is there we go and yes Becky is here uh, there we go so Becky you should be on yourself and you should be able to get your camera going okay tell me again how to that's okay. There is a webcam uh, option that you can click on to show you. There you are. Hey, great. Thanks. Well, good. Well, good morning, Becky. I'd like to introduce you to this group. I, I find her as the the uh, one of the very uh, willing uh, library commission uh, um, partnership 
libraries and individual out in western Nebraska. Um, she and I just want to mention about Becky, she and uh, four of the other libraries or three of the other libraries that committed to fiber and will receive fiber from this last year were part of what we talked about, which was a Sparks grant. And I'm hoping that she'll highlight a little bit of information about that because um, she not only uh, joined with us, but she got the governor to come out there and um, work with and have an open house uh, there with the kids. All the elementary kids came down and they had an open house for the Sparks Grant. The Sparks Grant was uh, an IMLS uh, grant that we had, and I can't even remember, Tom, the title of it because it was pretty darn long. Um, um, you the breaking ones? the Ice and oh, the ice and Internet ice Relationship. Thing. So like that, Nebraska Schools and Libraries. Right, and uh, basically it was a, a community um, where you, you had a school, and a library in agreement that they would use a, a fixed space wireless connectivity and they were capable of that between the school and the library. And this was pre-COVID-19 that we did this. This was before, so five years ago, addressing um, the homework gap, the fact that there are so many children in the community that may even go home with a device that they don't even have internet to use. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, you guys are great extemporaneously. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, this was just the beginning, and, and I think for those four libraries, I've talked to them from last year, and all of them, it was like, you know, the, the speed went from maybe they had 12, I know one library had six megabits, 12, maybe 25, um, to uh, 70 megabits to 200, I think there was a, one uh, connection that was that, I'm yeah. not sure. So it was anywhere from a 400 to 1500 percent temporary increase in bandwidth speed to these to the homework hotspot right. which was a new set of desktop computers that were in each of the libraries so um and i think they they offered wi-fi too did yeah. they not yeah so when so when the student would come in with their device they could they could also connect um in the, in the library but anyway i'm taking i'm taking becky's time but i just wanted to to mention that i think what happened there was boy, you got some speed that you didn't really want to let go of, or you may still have it, but you wanted to be able to be, you know, have it your your own. And in particular, some of those libraries, um, it, after three o'clock, then they would get um, the, the larger amount of bandwidth available to them because they were using it in the school before that. So Becky is uh, with fiber and in complete control now. So thank you, <laughs> Becky, for coming on board to talk to us. And it's yours. <laughs> well, basically, we're um, a small town of under 1,200 population, and so it's hard to get good internet anywhere in our town. And so the Spark Grant was wonderful. That when we worked with the school in getting there a taste of what the fiber was. Um, but like you said, during the day, we, we would have to share that with the school and all the kids there. But um, basically, um, we're lucky if we would get 25 um, megabits for our internet that we had for, well, for me to use and then also for the patrons. Um, they come in and there's a circle and, and the, each computer is plugged into a, a cable so they can get the internet. Well, problem there is the more people using it, the slower it would go. So um, when I heard about the opportunity, I thought, oh, that'd be great. Um, and you couldn't beat the cost. And yeah. so now um, we're able to get 500 megabyte, megabits. And it's just um, unbelievable what the speed will be. My problem is that when I went and did this, I did have help from um, the ESU a gentleman that that heart bleeds for the smaller communities that don't have the IT and and support, you know, from um, internally. And he, I had met him through the Sparks grant, and he's the one that had installed the access point from the school 
And so we had a working relationship. So he helped me come up with my items that I needed. And when it came down to the point where he said, I said, well, what about for all the installation? Because, you know, you can include that in your bid. He said, oh, I'll do all, you know, I'll do all that for you for nothing. Well, <laughs> that was great. But to, we're still not, it, the, the fiber's here and we're ready to roll and, and we're being billed for it, but I'm still not quite finished. Um, he's busy, school's gonna be starting, so he's very busy, so. But one of the problems I did run into is that I did not get my equipment ordered right away. And, and um, so not all of my equipment has come in. I'm waiting on um, a switch, and my two access points. So I, I can't um, stress enough that when, once you know what you need and once you know you got your funding, get that equipment ordered right away. Um, because I know it's not just uh, computer stuff that is behind, but you see it all over the world about the shortages of containers and, and, and stuff. So I learned the hard way <laughs> on that. Um, another thing that I wanted to tell you is, um, and Krista knows firsthand, she was there telling me all along, it'll, it'll happen, just, you just have to wait and wait, but um, all of my funding um, was approved except for the big one, the installation, and that was like $22,000, and so um, the company that I was working with, which was, oh, um, well, Nebraska Link or Optic Networks, which they're an awesome group. Um, they came to town, started getting the fiber going, got the lines run, and I'm sitting here sweating because I hadn't had the final approval. And here they are digging up outside, and I'm thinking, <laughs> Oh, this is going to be nice. Where am I going to come up with $22,000 to pay for this? But it was in the contract that, um, you know, upon that we would do this upon um, approval of the, the E-rate funding. So I knew I had that in my pocket, too. And um, it took quite a while to get that final one. Uh, approval, but I did finally, and then I could go, shoo, that was good. Well, Becky was the first, you were the first library um, from, you were the inaugural li library to do the filing for the, uh, the 470 with the uh, special construction category one. So for her to be the second to the last to be approved for that, and then she had applied for the category two. So again, I think she's got some, uh, um, an interesting story to tell you, don't worry, you know, um, um, things will happen eventually. <laughs> and, and, uh, and Krista kept uh, reassuring me that sometimes it, it happens after the start date. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because I kept thinking, man, we're getting closer to July, we're getting closer to July. But, um, but I did reach out to um, the gal that was in charge of my case and so they are approachable. If you get a message, you know, you can talk to them, you can ask. And um, once you talk to them and you find out, you know, that they're drowning in all these things that they need to get done, then you can kind of understand. But I just kind of pointed out that, you know, I'm kind of anxious, you know, I want to want to be able to, you know, and stuff. And it all worked out, but it, it did, uh, it was, touch and go there for me anyway. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, that's an important thing to understand. This this is just a thing having to do with E-rate in general. Nothing specific to our special construction projects that we're doing here is that it can take they are going through hundreds of thousands sometimes of applications and requests and mm -hmm. um sometimes it takes some time. Um and you just yeah just need to have patience uh, as becky said it, right now for this 2021 year we still have 
in Nebraska, a few libraries have applied for E-rate and still have not received their notification or answer back yet of a yes or no on the funding. Not not special construction specifically, but anybody. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just how it works. Um, but what is important is even if they don't get you your official answer until after the funding year starts, which starts July 1st, you get the funding back to July. You get it gets you know you get credited for everything. Um, but yeah, reaching out to them sometimes does help, and it did actually with her. She just said. Yeah. Hey, just help. Can you tell me what's going on? And they realize, oh, let's let's try and move yours along. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt. You've got a, you've got someone's assigned to your case, your application, and you can always say, just wondering what's going on. Right, right. <laughs> and having uh, that, that specific clause, we did do that to add that specific clause to all the contracts um, that you do have that states the um, the library does have the um, they can they can cancel out of this contract if the e rate e rate is not approved. So you will sign a contract with these companies, but there will be this out just in case because the e rate is not a guarantee. E rate is not a guarantee. It's I'd say it's a 99% guarantee that it'll go through eventually, unless there's something drastically wrong with your application, which our job, mine and Holly and Tom's, is to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but we always have that clause in there, as Becky said, that little in your pocket that they, they're they welcome to come and do the construction and start if they what the company wants to. But if something crazy happens and E-Rate says no, the library is not on the hook for that. And it's in that contract that the company knows that right. the, going forward with this contract is contingent on approval of uh, the E-Rate funding. Now, the company that I went through only provides um, fiber to um, government organizations. So they I was hoping that they could branch out to like our people in Baird, you know, home residential and stuff, but they can't. But they could do the city office, the fire hall, the any government stuff like that. But I know that there are some um, other providers that probably can. But I only had two two um, bids, so. And they were significantly different in different in pricing. Um, right. Amazing. They were. Yeah. And one of them, I think they just kind of, eh, you know, I. I have their business now, so I don't need to worry about it. They didn't even actually follow the um, the RFP uh, requirements. Do you remember that, Holly? Yeah. Yeah, they just kind of did what they wanted, so they shot themselves in the foot. So, Becky, this is Tom and Lincoln. I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, so when you're going through program integrity assurance, the PIA process, was there um, any um, request that you had to turn back to the company to help you answer those questions? Or were you able to answer all those uh, yourself or with the library commission? Um, I'm pretty sure I answered it all with the library commission, yeah. Okay. Between Krista and Holly, I think so. Yep, so that's a good testimony to the uh, comprehensiveness of your procurement because the more information you get on the front end, then the less you have to go out and speak uh, when the questions start rolling in. So, uh, yes, we're very familiar with Nebraska Link Optic. Uh, we think of them almost like a wholesale company. Um, besides governmental, they'll do large business. Um, they're definitely in the fiber business. And they also sell to smaller telcos because they have fiber over the entire state or they may sell to a fixed wireless company who's going to send signals out to rural nebraska so they'll bring fiber to the base of a tower and then that company will actually buy internet from nebraska link and then uh, redistribute it so they're the first uh, largest provider of circuits on network nebraska and Great Plains is the second largest. Mm. Yep, very familiar. Well, they were very, very good to work with. Good. Down to the guy that was digging the holes. I mean, they were they were mm -hmm. very professional. 
-hmm. Great. And a lot of times these companies will hire a service. Um, one of the most famous is Bauer Underground out of Norfolk, Nebraska. So they're a subcontractor to put fiber in the ground. And then there's other companies that would put fiber overhead and they actually bring it into the libraries, you know, as a, it would look like a telephone or electrical line and it comes in overhead. But in all manner, we prefer that the fiber be put underground so that uh, we're immune from squirrels, like we talked about on Monday. I guess mainly I wanted to, you know, be sure and tell you to order your equipment early. And um, there is funding. I mean, you can include the installation and all that. And I think maybe if I were to do it over, I would would maybe go ahead and do that, but yet still have been as a helper um, just because um, of how busy he is with his job too and having to do this for me when he's not working. Yeah. That's a, that's a good cautionary tale there because I have met Ben and Ben is just a heart of gold, a wonderful person in the, and I know Becky is saying that, but it, you just have limits. And, um, and what you can do, and it, it is a busy time for him. So, and that also might help out for when you really need him in a pinch for something else, you know, he, he might not have be, you know, he may be more available for that. But but anyway, hindsight is 2020. And I, I think in general though, you got one of the best of the best to help you, so. Yeah, and um, as, far, as far as, you know, Chris does, knows um the e-rate um usac from i don't know she could do anything blinded i think with that so don't ever hesitate to call her and she'll walk you through and holly she can help you figure out what equipment you um i think when we did it holly and cynthia uh there was a cynthia that was there still and that's how we uh first you know wrote down the model number and what we had and then we went from there but yeah well i was hoping you wouldn't say holly can talk me into anything <laughs> <laughs> that's all right <laughs> and Tom came out when we did the spark grant he was here for that yeah mm -hmm. yep tom's tom's a friend of uh, public libraries nebraska public library for sure yeah. So Becky, if you're at liberty to share, I'm sure the libraries online are a little interested in your pricing uh, before and after. And the way that Nebraska Link came back with, if I'm not mistaken, level pricing. So you could have bought 100 megabits and been just fine, but didn't they price it as a same cost at 500 as they did 100, is that true? Yes, they did. So actually having the fiber is going to be cheaper internet for me than what I was paying, um, you know, with, through a different company. Um, I think by the, t because you can also then, what you know, you'll have to, or I do, I use E-rate for my um, monthly, you know, internet cost and mm -hmm. I'm down to 30 bucks for fiber. For, for 500, 500. For 500, yeah. So I, that's, it's, you know, unbelievable. I think we call that a success story. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, I wouldn't have known anything about any of this if it wasn't for the, the Library Commission. So thank you guys for all that you do. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from anybody else? Anybody have any? Yeah, does anybody have any questions for Becky? Um, I double checked. I've got you. Everyone is unmuted on my side, uh, so you're just muted by your on your on your own. Um, if you want to ask any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask right now while we've got Becky on the line with us. Holly, is the Public Service Commission going to do that extra uh, ten percent with this new one also? Yeah, this is a four-year program, and you were part oh, of the okay. first year for it. Okay. Yeah. 
And what I yeah. what I don't know is if they're going to use the same application. I have a call in about that for this next mm -hmm. year, but. And I, how did you feel about that form? Pretty easy to fill out, wasn't it? It was. It was pretty easy. And, you know, they, yeah, you could answer it. I don't think I had to have help, really. I think it worked out good. So I encourage you. It's definitely worthwhile. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and that's that's a good question to ask about, about how long this is. This is year two of this extra special extra funding from the state. So, and as Holly was mentioning too, if you, or, and I think Tom too, um, if you don't not sure if you're ready to jump on board with the whole fiber construction thing this year, you could do the category two and upgrade all your equipment, and then next year, and even the year after that, this extra 10% um, state matching funds from the Public Service Commission will still be available for you. So. You have time. So I, at, at the risk of, you know, um, <laughs> uh, our next topic is the RFP, uh, the template RFP that you work through to submit with your 470. Becky, what did you think of that? Was that a, something that uh, was easy for you or? Um... I think I had questions, but um, when I asked my question, it was easy to, you know, it looks like a lot and it's overwhelming thinking, oh my gosh, all this. But um, you guys, when you got the help at your finger, go for it. There, you have good support. They are a great support system. And um, even if, like they said, if you decide to get the upgrade, the equipment, do yeah. that and then you'll have it all and you won't be waiting like i am you know for the show slow ship from china and then you'll be ready for the other but um yeah i it it's pretty walk yourself through i think there was a couple places where i didn't understand what they were what what i needed to put on there but you were well, there to help and yeah, and you're probably not used to working yeah. through that type of a project, so that would right. be understandable. I just have one more question, and 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 I don't, and you can say no to it, but I guess for me, I'm excited to see what libraries do with this um, increase in internet speed. If there are programs you're thinking about offering or equipment or anything, I know that the Baird Public Library is not ex extraordinarily large. But are there some things you're thinking about doing now that you have reliable, scalable speed of fiber? Well, I visited uh, with you before about maybe um, sharing it with either, we don't have a community center. We do have a senior center and we do have the fire hall that seems to be the community hub. Um, so, we could get the equipment and maybe bounce it from us to the fire hall. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the, another next step that we could work with too. Because you know Holly, she's a go-getter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had this conversation and, and, and uh, yeah. I just mentioned it is ECF eligible. So that would yeah. be something yeah. that you could look into. So cool, yeah. very neat. We're just right now, we're just glad to be able to have a summer reading. We're glad to be able, um, I'm in the middle of a teen program right now. It's nice just to be able to have, be together. Mm -hmm. So we're holding our breath to see how long that lasts. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. It doesn't look like anybody had any questions. Nobody's typed anything in or unmuted themselves, so. Thank, thank you so much, much, Becky. Yeah, thanks for asking me. Okay. So our next topic is the special construction RFP uh, preview and discussion. Is this? Yeah, eventually we'll get there. We got a couple slides. Yeah. So we we'll need to. Are you no, not yet. Okay. If you take it out and just minimize it for a second. There we go. It's jumping the gun. So um, as we were visiting with Becky, I asked her about the RFP because um, I think it's important that it um, that it be usable by uh, the library directors and they're not intimidated by it. So we do have a template that was created and I, I, I um, put it together using a couple of other uh, library RFP 
piece for special construction, and then uh, it has some cut, obviously customization for Nebraska Public Libraries, and um, and uh, a lot of help from Tom as far as uh, giving me the um, reviewing it uh, iterations of it along the way. So we'll move on to the next slide. So basically, again, here's my, my heavy wording slides I'd like to do, but um, basically talking about if you don't know what a request for proposal is, basically, uh, there it is, a document issued by a business or an organization to request vendor bids for products, solutions, and services, which is what we're going to be doing with special construction, or you will be doing. Um, in particular here, just as just a summary of uh, some information, when you're visiting with, even if you're uh, talking to a vendor and you don't mention that you're using E-Rate and you're just wondering what the cost of it is, what we're looking for is for at least uh, lit fiber is what you'll be requesting. And one thing to know is it's also strongly recommended by the E-Rate program uh, to comply with E-Rate state level and local bidding rules by submitting an RFP for your Form 470. The dark fiber, there are like, I think, four options of types of special construction that you can request. Dark fiber says you must use an RFP. I would challenge you to think that you could write this in in a few paragraphs to be able to um, submit this. And I, we would not recommend any of us that you submit for a, a special construction without using an RFP. And again, we have an RFP for you to use. So that's wonderful. Um, so when there's these three items here, and as part of it, the RF, with the RFP, uh, this criteria must be in. You need to address this in the RFP or have the response come back addressing this, or the PIA group uh, will be on your case, um, and they, you know, that you'll have to be providing more information. But it's uh, it, it, uh, you have to have uh, the scope of you know the project itself. Uh, the I need to look at I can't read that on my screen. Let me see if I can. Um, uh, so uh, the analysis and comparison of hard data is what you have to do too. So what you're going to be asking for, and we'll go over this. We ha I have some filled in uh, appendixes that tell you uh, what you're asking for, and then they get filled in by the vendors who are uh, responding to your RFP. And also part of this RFP, you're going to see that you have to have qualified vendors. And within this RFP, you you outline these types of this type of information, saying, hey, you know, you need to be this, this, and this in order to be able to submit a RFP for uh, uh, submit a response to this RFP. Um, and then we had talked about this, you know, the cronyism and uh, the the feeling about, you know, maybe you're going to be rewarded the contract. Becky mentioned that with the, her previous vendor that um, that uh, did apply or respond with an RFP. And so now we're going to switch. Um, this is just information. If you want more information about RFPs, we can talk about it. But I, I really think I wanted to spend this time uh, just reviewing the RFP. So Tom, you. Oh, All right. I'm going to so make you. I'm going to make you a break. Break. How about a break? Tom just put a sign in front of me that said break. So, oh, you want to take a break instead? Okay, we can do that yeah, first. We'll take a break and then we'll get back. Thanks. Yeah, because we're <laughs> almost an hour and a half in today. So. Yeah, that's right. So that's a good timing. It's 10, 10 minutes? Um, sure. If we want to, we can take a five or 10 minutes, depending on what people. Yep. Come back at uh, some 10 30 ish. 10.30, yep, it's 10.20 on my computer clock right now. 10.30, we will start up again. So um, go ahead, take a break, get up, stretch, hit your restroom, refresh your coffee, whatever you need, and we will start right back up at 10.30. Hey, Holly. Yes? Quick question. Are you going to hold our hand through all of this? Because all of it's going over my head. Who is this? I can't see. Oh, sorry. This is Stephanie from um, Orleans. Oh, absolutely. And I love doing it. And I can give you testimonies from library directors that I have done that with. And I think they're, they're all very happy. 
Um, <laughs> and and I think you know this is why I wanted to go over the RFP and let you just visually see it. And um, every step of the way, um, I'm there now. Krista primarily works with um, the um, the E-rate portion, but she's very informed too. But that's kind of how we've divided it out. So the RFP or any of the uh, equipment assessments um, and the ordering for the equipment would be something that I would be working with you with. But Krista is like a whiz at the 470 and the 471. So if you're submitting that um, and uh, you want some uh, assistance, she's there for you. So I think in general, we're, we're all there. We'll help you. Thanks. Yeah, it's yeah, the equipment we're stuff that's intimidating. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think once that's why it's really we have you have to be careful how much information we give, and, but you can't give just part of the information here. That's that's an issue, you know, as how to make mm -hmm. that um, uh, available to you without making you feeling overwhelmed. Hang in there is all I can say because <laughs> that'll be lovely for that community to have. Um, a library with fiber, you know. Um, someday I'll t I'll tell you the story about what how the VTOP grant went with downloading uh, six desktop computers with 52k of internet speed. <laughs> oh, gee. So anyway. I can only imagine. Yeah, everyone's really excited for the fiber. It's just they're all looking to me now because I opened my mouth and told everybody I was so excited, and now I'm going, oh, oh I have no idea what half well, the stuff. We can't, you know. All you can do is go fishing, you know, and then <laughs> and then and then you'll decide. You know, I don't know if you were were you with us on Monday. I can't remember. Yes. You did. yes. Okay. So again, that's that's what that's what you need to be saying to your community is we're going to go fishing and we're going to find out. You yeah. Know? And um, and that and I think that's the best way to respond to that. Yeah. But okay. yes, we'll be there through the whole thing. Yeah, we're not just putting this out here and then letting you. No. You no, this whole program is actually us guiding, running it pretty basically with the Public Service Commission. Well, it's they're funding, money. yeah, and we do the work. I guess is how this is turned. Yeah, um, but yeah, we you know Holly will get you figured out what you have, what you need, equipment, and when it comes to actually submitting the forms and the RFPs, we go back and forth. Um, and uh, you can talk to any of the previous libraries who did it too if you wanted to. Like, well, um. Yeah, I kind of I haven't really asked them to um, if it would be okay to have everybody visit with them. Um, but I was going to do that as part of my between now and next week when I send out the additional email, just to mm -hmm. confirm that they're okay with it. But I'm sure they will be. But I feel it's important that I just ask. But yeah, we had a lot of constant back and forth with um, any of the libraries that needed it. Nobody was left on their own to try and figure it out. No. Right. I'm going to excuse myself here, so I'm going to. Thanks. Sorry for taking your time. I just appreciate it. Yeah, this is this is Tanya from Ashland, and I I feel the exact same way you do. <laughs> it's well, alright. Gotcha. <laughs> I got nervous once you guys started talking equipment. The rest of it, I was I was on board for, but then you started talking equipment. And I'm like, I don't know what a rack is. That I don't is, know what half the words you're saying are. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That is this, I think, the scariest part. But that, that's fine. We will, um, we'll get you through that. Rack is easy. That's actually out of all the equipment, the simplest one. It's just all the shelves that the stuff goes on. <laughs> the rack is just those metal shelves. If you've seen pictures sometimes of computer, <laughs> yeah, and it just helps organize it, which is really nice. Like, like Holly was saying, it's some of these people they've just got, you know, routers and things piled up somewhere, and nobody knows what goes to what, and the and the cords and whatnot. Put it on some nice, neat racks. Looks all pretty, and you can see everything. So it's actually oh, okay. the shelving is all of that is, yeah. That like, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> all right, it is 10.30 by my computer clock. So. Hello. We're yep, back. hello. Yep. Um, so, so we're ready to, have, to give you presenter control again? Yeah, uh, yes, okay. please. All right, hold on a sec. There you go. You should be able to share your screen, show your screen. There we go. Looks good.
All right. Now, how do I min how do I minimize us at the top there? Can I get rid of us? Uh, just just go ahead and click anywhere on the RFP on the oh, document. No. Okay. You're so, gone. Yeah. We're gone. I'm still. We're still here. People. Just, <laughs> just not, Okay, well, is everybody back or how are we doing? Um, uh, go ahead. They don't actually leave, so I don't know. <laughs> go oh, ahead. Okay, just want, <laughs> wanted to make sure that if we had anybody who had uh, something coming up. Okay, well, we're off um, and running here to, this is the, um, the RFP that was put together for last year's inaugural group. Um, you'll see in here, I have not updated it for 2022. I don't plan on making a lot of changes. I did see a few typos as I was going through this um, from last year, and, and so um, I will be updating those. And there are some things I, I might want to make clear, but in general, this is what you will be getting, um, receiving from the Library Commission as your option for uh, an RFP. Um, number one is I would st say that you should be sure that you share this with um, your local government entity, whomever it might be, um, and board members, and, and make sure that it meets whatever the criteria is in your your local community. Um, because uh, you know, I don't think you can do this um, in a vacuum. You'll need to make sure that they're aware of it, and you may need to ask them for some assistance and agreement to be a um, have their name in it under various um, responsibilities. So that's, I think that's all I have to say. Oops. So this is the contents. Uh, there's actually, get down to the 25 um, lines of it. And I think what we'll do is just kind of float our way through. There's some areas I may not have much to say about and other areas that um, we'll talk more about. Um, and if there's something as we're going along, you have a question about, you can either wait till the end to talk about it or we'll go back and take a look at it. So here, right off the bat, um, we have our entry page. And basically this is kind of like a summary for your potential uh, responder. I kind of like the idea of personalizing it. So we had libraries that put their logo in there or they put an image of their library up there at the top. Um, if you need help with that, I'll help you with that. Anything in red here um, definitely is something that uh, you will be having to replace. What I loved about this is, um, and I use the same consistent um, <clears throat> words for things. And so you can pretty much do a replace all or replace one at a time as you read through it. And and before you know it, you're three quarters of the way done with it. Um, so that's one thing about it that if you're intimidated by this, don't be with all those pages because it is pretty easy to uh, complete the form. So this is basically a template for the calendar for the RFP. And here, you may not be able to make uh, heads nor tails about it. I guess I would say, don't worry about it when you start off and trying to fill this out because farther in there's a, a lengthy description uh, of each of the numeric uh, activities that need to be done helps you to fill it out and then uh, then you'll, you can come back and fill this out afterwards this is more or less for uh, you know the vendor who's coming in and saying oh yeah I see you know that kind of a thing here I know I have a mistake and I maybe Krista will want to talk about it because we discovered um, that you can't have underscores in any uploads that you do for the Form 470 and E-rate. So I will change this for sure, oh, but right? No, no. Yes, yes. Yeah. That technical thing we discovered last year. <laughs> yeah, but no underscores. So I'll, and I'll also note that in there so you, that you will know. So again, we're gonna disregard the calendar right now just simply because we have one that has explanation with it later on in the RFP. Uh, this was uh, authored by uh, yours truly, Tom Rolfus. And I, as you may recall, we talked about that uh, vendors in Nebraska have not uh, ever worked with special construction before um, as far as um, <clears throat> with libraries, uh, individual uh, libraries uh, requesting uh, 
internet fiber. And so he uh, put together a kind of a background for the vendors. Um, most of them, I think, are aware of who you are also. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but uh, it I, was a learning experience for them last year. Right. And they exactly. were not all perfect in their response. So we're hoping after a year of learning and a little. I'm going to leave it in for two years and yeah, then, then we'll take it. Yeah. Coaching. Uh, we'll get more productive bids. But this this information, um, in your own time, you may want to read it. It's it's good information for you, um, especially if you need to speak with somebody um, about uh, you know the the opportunity this opportunity and get a permission. It would be nice to be informed. So I I do like it um, to be in there. So we talked before about what what's part of a RFP. And here we have this, the scope of services. So this is identifying what it is you're planning to do. And again, if you see the calendar year, it isn't updated yet. And now you see more of the infamous um, uh, uh, fill in the blank once type of things that are in there. Um, and anything in red it could be descriptive too. So um, I don't know time-wise how much time we have. Um, uh, let's see if you want to just read through this too. Um, this is basically uh, just identifying what it is uh, you're looking for. And if you see up here at this last sentence, if you, uh, in order to qualify for or to submit a, a application for the mm -hmm. NUSF 117 grant, you need to be asking for a minimum of 100 megabits per second. That also is the case, I believe, for the match from the FCC for the other 10%. So for that magic 20% that's coming in, you've identified that you know for under 50,000 that you need to have the 100 uh, megabits per second. Um, and then under here, you see the other parts of the uh, RFP that you need to clearly illustrate network design and construction routes. That was another piece that they, of information that they wanted. Um, but if you read through it, um, I'll send this to you by next week, Wednesday. I'm gonna commit myself to that. You'll, you'll be able to reread through it. I just don't wanna spend a lot of time um, on each page of the 25 pages. You see here in this highlighted in red, uh, this will be important uh, to have whomever is bidding to put an initialization there. I did receive, or not, I shouldn't say I did, but I received copies back to libraries where the uh, responding vendor didn't do this. And I just think it's important for them to complete the form. This is what this is one of their first tasks to do. And um, so what we would do was uh, we would receive it and then we would give them an opportunity to uh, go back through and actually put a initialization on it. And this, it's important because this document can become part of your signed agreement at right. the end. Mm -hmm. It's either the body of it or the appendix uh, related, but um, to hold vendors accountable after the fact and while service mm -hmm. is in process, there's a lot of terms here that would apply. So here's an explanation of special construction. Again, this is, would be new. You know, if there's a vendor that didn't uh, apply last year, this would be new for them to understand what special construction is and what, what it means. And this is something, again, for you to read. Um, and the type of service that we are looking at is this is the request is for the least lit fiber or services. So um, this is telling them. Can you go back up just a bit? Okay, if I can. I don't know how to get up there and underneath. Scroll up with your okay, there we go. So this paragraph where it says note right after project management. Oh, yeah. Um, vendors are very familiar with um, non-recurring costs, which are the upfront to establish the service. They don't all use that technique in their bidding. A lot of times from our experience, they spill all their costs into monthly recurring because they think that schools and libraries do not have any money, which is pretty accurate. <laughs> but in this particular situation, we do need them to itemize numbers one, two, and three, but not in their normal non-recurring flavor. So they'll 
a bid and itemized construction network facilities, design and engineering, project management. If there are other costs like the equipment to, um, to make the service uh, usable, that may go in non-recurring, but it's not eligible for the special match. Or some companies charge $200 to establish your account in their billing system. That's a non-recurring cost, but it's not eligible for special construction. So if you receive any questions during the Q&A period and within the 28-day window of the RFP, that's um, important guidance, I think. Mm -hmm. And some of these vendors, this will be brand new to them. They've never participated. So we need to help them uh, construct their bids properly. But what you do with one, you do with all. Any eligible uh, respondent needs to hear the same information. So here is one area that I thought we would would hover over and talk a little bit about. So this would um, bid and contract exceptions. Um, of course, who is licensed in accordance with the law? and who does have a license qualifying for the state of Nebraska and certified with the Nebraska Public Service Commission. Um, and that would be something that uh, you will you might need to check on. I knew all, all the vendors that were, I knew of them, and so I knew that they were Nebraska vendors and then Public Service Commission uh, were, we're engaged with them. Right, and our partners over at the PSC can help respond to that. Right. And also a certificate of good standing with the Secretary of State, which could be number two. Uh, just be aware that your Form 470 and the accompanying RFP can be seen by any company in the country. Mm -hmm. So a couple years ago on Network Nebraska, we had a New Hampshire fiber reseller find our RFP, certify themselves with the Public Service Commission, responded to our procurement, and then won a circuit. And we're going, how is that possible? They have no infrastructure in the state, and mm -hmm. their, their business model mm -hmm. is to resell other people's fiber and then do it at a cut rate. Well, mm -hmm. uh, they were supposed to bring the circuit up on July 1. It didn't happen until November 15th. So I don't want to go into excruciating detail, but um, every vendor is eligible unless you have some type of ingredient or requirement that says they're not. And that's something we hope that that never happens. You only get qualified Nebraska companies responding or maybe Iowa or Colorado or something like that. Something we, at least, you know, yeah, can to us yes. that would make sense. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we did have a a, a response from te Texas with the, the local libraries yeah. last year, too. So, And so you either have a way to, you don't want to eliminate them because you have to be fair and open, but you also want to make sure that they're not a fly-by-night organization mm -hmm. or bidding something that they're just looking for extra business or they're going to take you for a ride, so to speak. So um we're worried about that always at the state and we try to incorporate language that will prevent that from happening mm -hmm. so so this part this next part is pretty critical and it may be some information um you you want to be sure to have a, a communication between yourself and the potential uh, bid award and so this is all the information that you need to supply this is where i saw one of my typos up there sell any of director. <laughs> um, yeah, just a quick thing on point of contact. If you're going to get interest from a provider that's unfamiliar or new to your community, um, in order for them to construct their bid response, it's really advantageous for them to, to do a, a walkthrough. I was going to talk about oh, that. Sorry. <laughs> but do it on your terms, mm -hmm. uh, not on theirs. So they need to meet your time frame. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, that's okay. Well, actually, you'll see later um, the the walkthrough. I think for um, the template that I'm using here, uh, 
when you were evaluating with a rubric as to the points for uh, the vendor, and we'll we'll get to that point. But one of the things it has in there is to do a walkthrough, and one and but yet it didn't have in here that that it, they had to. So it was one of the ways that you could make it a quick 20 points if you were. Um, but if it's a mandatory requirement and they mm -hmm. don't do a walkthrough, yeah, that's then true. they're eliminated. Well, maybe so. this will be something we change. <laughs> yes. Or you can yeah, I was going to say, that's, I mean, that is a way to eliminate these out-of-state. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, that's Hampton, a, it really, yeah. really is something you, you, you want to support our local businesses, I think, in that's general. But you can, requirement. Right. But it means any bidder must also then do that, no matter mm -hmm. where they're located in the state. So, so again, this, this section here um, has a lot of highlighting in red. So this would be something you would read through, and you would need to... Uh, to update and fill in. Um, so this was more of information about the contact between yourself and this potential vendor. So here we are again um, at the sequence of events, and this is more of the, uh, what was at the beginning, a little more, uh, a few more lines to it, and also it um, has an explanation of events. So well, let's just start and go through this. I think this is important for you to understand. This is all preliminary work that you'll have to do. You won't wake up one morning and say, oh, I think I'm gonna submit my 470 today with my RFP without having spent some time to think about what it is, that, what you need to know before uh, you submit it and fill in this information. So the release of solicitation would be um, you or you and Krista, the day that you actually submit the Form 470 and upload the completed RFP, um, and that's the date, the key date for when you start uh, your activities that follow. And so there is a time period that you allow for uh, interested parties to uh, submit questions to you. They may not want, not, not, not be ready to actually um, uh, submit a response, but they need, or they need clarification. So we have uh, five working days uh, after it's submitted for this. Now I have to say, unfortunately for <laughs> a couple of the libraries that submitted last year, the time got to be such a crunch. We basically had only three working days for them to do that, but we didn't, you know, have uh, a weekend or anything engaged in it, and that's that's what we did. I ended up working with a lot. Only one library had a uh, response or a, um, asked questions, and and then the library called me and we put together a response and they submitted it back to them. And they did apply, but they were just looking for clarification. So this is how the library responds uh, to the, the questions through a, a solicitation addendum and or amendment to be posted on the internet. And we have the USAC website and then also the NLC website. We, we pretty much, we used it also because uh, we didn't know if the local library would be able to manage the website and want to put in the time to set a structured page together for the information. So each of our libraries that we worked with, which were um, five of the libraries, um, we had a section in on our website, which was noted in the initial sending out of the RFP to local um, uh, vendors who were in the area where the library was located and it identified uh, the site where they could go and they could download the RFP from there and any questions or anything uh, back and forth amendments were stated in there. Again, there was only one and nobody else had any questions, so that was pretty easy to do. I'd be willing to let a library manage that if they wanted to. I don't have a problem with that, but I think it'd be easier just to let us do it. Um, you want to talk about deadline quick? Uh, yeah, the deadline is, th uh, we have 36 days after the RFP is released. Do you want to talk about it? Well, mandatory minimum is 28. 28 it yeah. can be longer, which is good, uh, because at the same time that all of our libraries here will be on the street, the state will be on the street with probably 40 or 50 circuits. Mm -hmm. 
Um, these are the same companies and they'll be responding to both. But my point about deadline, it should be day, date, year, time, and time zone. Mm -hmm. And whether or not uh, elsewhere in the RFP, are you going to accept responses by email, by print, uh, hand delivery, it's postmark, a, it's yeah, or so on. It doesn't matter which way you do it, but it's got to be specific and it's got to be applicable to all. So we had one situation years ago where one of our main providers uh, dropped their RFP to the state purchasing department two minutes after the deadline. It was not open. They lost $250,000 wow. worth of business because mm -hmm. they would have won the award. But uh, it's very specific. Um, otherwise, it could be midnight of that day or whatever. But whatever you choose, if it's got to be in person, drop off or whatever, make sure you're ready to back mm -hmm. that up. And the response has a, a deadline for the library to respond back. It's within two days. So this is the explanation of events. This is, and, and I think Tom's got a good point there that I, it, it needs to be added to the, the actual uh, table. But um, so, but this is what we're the expectation is. Um, so the proposal um, deadline has occurred, and one thing that I would like to say, and I'm not going to mention any libraries' names, but when those those proposals come in, you want to, you, again, yeah, you want to stamp them with the date and the time that they arrived. And so that's something you might jot down is if you can locate a um, stamp that has not just the date, but the time on it, that would be important to have. Um, what that's For some of the libraries, that was the biggest burger boo was trying to find that. The piece here is though, do not, do not open these proposals until you have all of them and you've passed your deadline. Um, you can open them at, you know, 3, I think this one has a 3 p.m. in the afternoon. At 3.01, you can be sitting down and opening them, but um, that's how it should be done. The process should be done. You shouldn't open them as they come in and hold on to them until the deadline and then say, okay, well, now let's really look at them. So please do that. And you see here for the team of three for the reviewers, it seemed like a nice number for a small rural library, library director, maybe the library board president, and somebody from um, either uh, the municipal um, administrative part of your, your community or a technical, if you want to, somebody from the school that is a IT or something like that. That would be some recommendations. Uh, so you do a, a review, and then you have a, during that review, you may throw some of the uh, RFPs um, out of the running because, or the responses, because they don't meet all the expectations. So you do have to read through it and see what the response is. And what they'll send you is the response for the RFP hopefully all filled out, and then they'll send you another 30 pages of, you know, information for you uh, related to their company, et cetera. Um, and I have something to say about that, too, and hopefully somebody will remind me about the, the spiral notebooks, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. But um, um, when, they do, when you do your evaluation with three reviewers, maybe independent of each other, and you end up with scores, uh, make sure okay. they're anonymous, so reviewer one, two, and three. And mm -hmm. because you're a public entity, if someone loses a bid, a provider, they can actually ask you for your scoring mm -hmm. and to show and verify that this company won and the reasons why. When money's at stake, uh, their values and <laughs> desperation changes. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of that and keep everything above board, mm -hmm. uh, pretty formal, pretty transparent. You don't owe them any of that information unless they request, mm -hmm. but be ready to provide it if, if requested. Yeah, I had every library last year, I had them put all of the, you know, when they did the scoring that they, you know, at least they told me they did, they put them all as, as it indicated, the one, two, three, and then also into a folder and just filed it away um, so it would be available. Um, 
that that's a good point to make too. Yep. Document, so, document, document. Put everything in yeah. writing somewhere. So Chris, Chris um, is the queen of that kind of information, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> well, E-rate makes you do it too. This is an E-rate rule. You know, you you need to have they they have the right to come and say, hey, why didn't we get this? We think we had the best proposal. Well, here's our reasoning. And know that you may just get one response, and and you can do five, six, and seven pretty much. Sure. You know, all all at one time and one. Might not have an actual competitive bidding process. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> so time. so this is just um, uh, it can be compressed down, or if you are busy and you can't get together, we had a couple of because of uh, last year um, with and with COVID. Um, with the responses, we had some of them do, um, they didn't actually, I don't know if that's a problem, they didn't physically meet together, but they were in a Zoom meeting that mm -hmm. I participated in, so that was it. So, uh, post notification of attend to award. So, I, uh, Krista, I would like you to visit about this because um, I did not publish this anywhere. anywhere. I just put this um, to the library to inform the um, the, the award winner that they had won the award and I thought you had indicated that would be okay to do yeah you mean as opposed to like making a public press release yeah. or announcement uh -huh. yes and it's it's customary to tell all the vendors uh, if you just if there's only two or three just email them mm -hmm. especially the ones who were not awarded mm -hmm. we're awarding to this company thank you for your interest in our procurement but you, you don't know, need so to put it on the website no, or anything. It's uh, just that, state in Nebraska yeah. does, but here you do not. Have to. Okay, yeah. so that's that's yep. different. But yeah, it is good to inform uh, the the award winner, obviously, and then those that did not receive the award. Uh, and the finalization, that's where you're communicating with the um, awardee and yourself, and then just to make sure everything lines up in a row uh, for you. Um, and I don't know if Tom, you have anything else. If there's anything in particular that is a conversation with the contract finalization period. Um, if your municipality retains legal services, and they quite well do, a county attorney mm -hmm. or something like that, it wouldn't hurt it during this framework uh, to get another set of eyes saying, "This is what we've evaluated. This is how we're going to award. This is the terms of our P. These are the terms." that the provider pushed at us and uh, just have a quick legal review. As long as it doesn't cost you a ton of money, it mm -hmm. just helps, you know, kind of validate your process, gives you the peace of mind uh, as a library director. And then uh, the, the award, the contract is awarded. Basically, again, this, you know, with, you, there's a caveat of you have to have the funding for this to happen. And then you do, you can come up with a start date, um, but in general, that is not followed through. So that's, but it just kind of completes your your calendar there. Yeah, and there's a difference between contractor start date. So you sign the agreement with the vendor, they're now under your direction. So mm -hmm. that could be February 25th, March 1, whatever. But the actual service start date of the fiber, the goal, the target is, a July 1, but it gives them from the time of your e-rate filing or you're waiting until you're funded and then you submit your order for service. If you submit your order right after your 471 filing and you're just crossing your fingers, mm -hmm. that company will do like what happened with Becky and they're going to be in the ground mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're a willing payer of service. So just know that it doesn't have to be July 1, 2022. It could be later. Take your own sweet time. Make sure you're funded with the rate and then submit the work order following your contract. Yeah, if you look at number one here, this is, the state is subject to change at the discretion of the point of a point of contract. Contact, I mean. So um, yeah, so that would be the, the library here. Um so and I'll just to give a little warning about that too. You know, you said Becky's just came and did it. Um and they may sometimes be a little pushy about it. They want to get it done. They want to get it done. And it's okay to keep saying contract and stuff says you got to wait. I understand. We've got another library we're still waiting on and, and they keep nudging and we're like, you're welcome yeah. to start digging, but 
until this is approved from E-Rate, this is not really a done enough deal. So Correct. the company endures the risk right. if they want to do yeah. it in their time without the work order in hand. So you're protected. Right. And I think that they knew that actually, yeah. you know, and they they went ahead and did it because she did talk to them about it. So we do have a question that came in. We were talking about the the making this decision making and documentation. Um, and I don't know about this question. Um, Tanya wants to know: Is there a score sheet from us that we provide, or do they create one? You know, for deciding the criteria of who they're going to pick for what. There we go. Yes. <laughs> It's a little farther down, Tanya. But and basically, um, and this is just a hypothetical. As I, we told them in training last year um, with the workshop, you you can make the decision. But here, this is where you see that there was a walkthrough, and that's 20 points. And actually, there were there was one set of two biddings, and the 20 points. Of course, it went toward the library that uh, the vendor that the library would have preferred. But it, it made the difference. Yeah. But they had so to come through. The yeah. They did the walkthrough. Yep. So the, anyway, so this is the um, this also has some resources that are connected to it that kind of help you to understand um, how to put together a rubric scoring. So we'll go back up. Um, so you can make a decision also as to how your library receives these um, documents. Um, in, in this one, we ask them not to send it as an email, even though we, when I say we, I shouldn't say it, but the libraries did receive some that were emailed to them, probably more for the vendor just phishing kind of, uh, mm -hmm. of response um, or a fax. So you need to either have it, in this case, um, for this RP currently, it has to be hand delivered or mailed with a midnight um, uh, so time postmark. Stamp. Postmark as midnight. As long as it's part of the deadline. Yeah, yeah. So it may show up two days later because that's the other thing you may want to think about here is that where you want that to show up because if your library isn't open all the time, which many rural libraries aren't, then you might want to work that through. Maybe you have a city office that they could you could have your date and time stamp there and that they take care of that when it arrives, if they have somebody walk in. Because some of the RFP responses were delivered, hand delivered and others were mailed. And U.S. Postal Service from Lincoln Omaha right now is four days. Mm -hmm. So keep, keep that in mind. And so, you're all experiencing that probably in rural mm -hmm. Nebraska. So this, this gives you some uh, information about um, um, how you know, how you will receive it. So here we have a bunch of general conditions. Um, uh, one in particular here for the PIA review, it says, um, so it says all applications, including special construction are subject to detailed questioning during a PIA review. And so one of the things for Tanya had mentioned earlier, oh no, Steph, had mentioned earlier I think she wasn't she was feeling very concerned about you know the the complexity of this one thing is that once you have a uh, the 471 submitted whoever your vendor is they will get all the technical questions um, related to the, the from the PIA and related to the project that won't come necessarily to you. Hopefully you would be carbon by it. No, no that's what I thought. No, no. Oh, yeah. I'm wrong then. And okay. Then so share I, them okay. If appropriate. So go ahead. Now, the applicant, which is the library, will, will be contacted by the reviewers from USAC for, about the rate. Um, but then if you need to, the you can reach out to the whoever your vendor is and say, oh, they need you to I need that you to help answer this question because I don't know if it is a okay. technical. So that, yeah, that would be what instead of saying what I said, it would be that you have the the ability to to look to them, and they actually in this RFP somewhere they state they are willing to do that. I do know that that's yeah. in there. So, so that's an obligation that they they're they're agreeing to do that on behalf of this project. Um, So 
again, I'm not sure, you know, time-wise, I hate to be taking this all this time to go over this because we'll send it to you. Um, and some of this, frankly, I don't know what the Davis-Bacon Act is, and, but it, I think it's pretty important and I can't remember what it was. Um, so here, this is one thing is, this is where I was talking about the spiral piece that, um, that I mentioned. You'll get some lovely, lovely, <laughs> glossy brochures in as your response. I mean, truly beautiful. But then they'll send you three of those and you need to make a copy of it. <laughs> So be sure uh, to identify that you know when they 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 provide you with the original copy and maybe uh, duplicate copies could be um, um, free paper you know just um, not bound that you could make copies of that was a problem we just basically it wasn't really a problem we just uh, asked the vendor to send a, a online copy of it. <clears throat> so here is the toward the end here. Um, this is what the vendor needs to do as part of their report back to you. Um, this is all the, the items that they need to complete in order to be um, uh, considered. So we went over this rubric before and so you make them aware of what you know what points they, you know what your point system is so they know what they they're trying to achieve the hundred percent um and so here it's the the that that has to be a symmetrical scalable solutions 100 by 100 minimum so you would say that preference will be given to solutions based on uh, that would be something you probably want to score, mm -hmm. and that could be embedded in the rubric. It's okay. something you might want to think about. Okay. Otherwise, it's just a subjective judgment. Okay, so another update. <clears throat> so if you read here, it says the mandatory tables provided to summarize. I have another document for this appendix A, B, and C that was actually filled out um, that I wanted to bring up. So here is a, a library's response from a vendor who was awarded. Um, and basically you're saying, this is similar to what happened with um, Bayard Public Library. Do you see how the uh, contract the the cost is the same. Um, oh no, your cost was the same for for all 100 to 500. Yeah, per but, year. But here it sure. doesn't matter how many years you're with them. So looking at this, um, I I do have the location in there there, and we're asking them within the RFP, can you give us for between 100 and 500 um, some pricing? for three years, that's inside the RFP. So this is their response to that. And then no taxes and fees. And I like Tom to explain that taxes and fees. Would you mind for? Sure. Mm -hmm. So in the E-rate world and with all telecommunication circuits in Nebraska, they're subject to the Nebraska Universal Service Fund surcharge. And that's administered by the PSC or collected thereof, 6.95%. So that is certainly, most companies will bill that. It'll either be absorbed into the monthly recurring, or in this case, it may be itemized, but that's not an unusual fee. And then at least two of our providers in the state have been subject to a federal regulatory fee of about another 1%. If they're going to charge that as a flow through to you, the customer, they need to itemize that here. So what you're trying to do with this cost proposal is achieve no surprises. Right. And that is, sure, their base rate is 99.90 a month for one, two, or three years. Well, what if the taxes and fees show up on your first invoice is $50? So you don't want that to happen. So your language in the cost proposal requires the vendor to 
bring all those up front so that you can do a valid evaluation. If they make good on 99.90 and everything's included, that's great. Mm -hmm. But they can't uh, introduce costs after the fact when you've already evaluated and awarded them mm -hmm. based on 99.90. Mm -hmm. So, good question. So um, here, this is the other Appendix B also required. And it tells how many strands and the the time uh, the length of uh, mileage and cost and what is eligible to be um, submitted to E-rate. Mm -hmm. And this is one I will mention this. For some reason, not all of the responses, even the um, accepted ones included this. Uh, we had a couple of libraries where we couldn't find where they filled this in, and then even on their response, there was the, the strand count or the, the distance, that mileage, of like, which is how far it takes to get from where the fiber is to your building. Um, and we had to reach out while I was helping a library do their form, 471, the second form that this information is provided in. Um, we got to that point, and it was a surprise. Like, wait, why can't we find this information? And somehow it got missed. Um, so make sure they fill this in, or we actually found out it was actually a quick phone call to the company, especially when they are local, as opposed to in New Hampshire or wherever. Um, <laughs> at least two of them, I think, just at the, while I was on online with them working on the forum, they said, hang on, I'll call Bob at the company. And they did, and he knew right off the top of his head, gave him the answer, and they continued on with the form. So um, get that info, but it says it's required, and somehow it got skipped with making sure we had that information. Well, that's good information because that's something that would be easy to check when you receive uh, your bid and if it's the awarded bid, if you look through it, and then you don't have to have a PIA review. Um, you know. Well, that's not, no, they won't, we can't even submit the form without that info. It wouldn't let me go forward. You can't oh, submit the form. Oh, I see. It's part of, oh, okay. In the course yeah. of you must yeah. have this. Yes. Yeah. Yep, it's one of the things I ask is strand count and uh, the number of feet or it, that it is. Take care of that um, before you contact Krista. Yeah. About the we learn. Yes. Good. Um, so those two are required as part of the response from uh, for the RFP. This is required. Um, not all libraries completed this in their response. This one, um, not all the vendors res uh, responded um, and completed this, but you do have to if you are the awarded vendor. But this kind of gives you a breakdown, and, and you'll see this when you receive the RFP of the cost um, for the project, which is, is nice to have also. I had wished more of them had done this um, just as a response to the 470. So, Krista, is this part optional? Not optional. Um, well, I'm wondering, that right there, total distance of the project, that sounds more like what the 471 is asking for, that very yeah. first thing there. With the OSP information, that never came up in your experience in any of the... It's nice to know, mm -hmm. but is... Is this it? Is yeah. required. They didn't request that separated out when you do the 471. No. A after the fact, you can make it be a requirement of the RFP. Yeah. But PIA yeah, yeah, never asked. For I it. think it in there somewhere. Uh, we'll like we'll take a look and we'll I'll respond mm -hmm. to that on Wednesday because I thought that it it said that the PIA would require you to fill out the information in Appendix C. I'll just check it out. Yeah, B for sure. Mm -hmm. The one right before this. This one seems like A right. and B are for sure, I think. Yeah. And then but C might be nice to know additional detail, but may not be called upon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did it say something at the top? No, it didn't. Okay. Well, anyway, so those are uh, three, uh, the three appendixes, and these um, have the information in them. Okay. I think the, I don't know where we're going from here. That may be it. Um, there was there. Oh, oh, on this Signature one. Page. Yeah, I need to go back to the other page. <clears throat> so again, this, these are included in the RFP. Uh, they unfortunately they are not um, in the spreadsheet format. 
so this uh, is continuing on in the RFP. This is more probably more information just for the respondent, so they know this is your expectation, um, how things should be left after um, the project is completed, or what they need to do as they're com when they're working through the project. And the specifications and permits. And I don't know what a tracer wire installation is. <laughs> <laughs> I do not either. And, and the depth of burial, all of these things, um, quite honestly, were just taken from the other um, RFP that I worked with that um, just had this information in it, and it seemed to be important yeah. to include. You hope include. that they're industry standards, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you they also are. hope you don't get any questions about these things when, if they've seen it in the RFP. And so, provide an alternative. So here it is, uh, an optional documentation for E-rate review, the drawings, but most of them did submit um, all of this type of information in their their glossy reports. So so I hope everybody's still awake because this is. <laughs> So here, this is important. I had a couple of, we had a couple of libraries that didn't even sign the back commitment page. It's at the very, at the very last page. We're at the end of the RFP, but um, you need to be sure that this is signed uh, also. And I think basically that closes me out for information about the RFP. Are there any questions? I know this was really difficult to understand. It'd be much easier when you have it in hand to look at it and it will be updated and given to you on Wednesday. Um, I think the important part for you to focus on, focus on is the key individuals that you put in place in the RFP as responsible. One of them is who signs the contract, and I, um, I think that's important that you figure that out. The, some library directors took the responsibility and signed it, and others had somebody in, the, in their city officials do that. And the calendar, I mean, I'm willing to sit down and go over that with you for your calendar of events to make sure that it it, it hangs together and it, uh, you know, it will pass scrutiny uh, for bidding. Um, please call me and, and let me take a look at it with you and, and see. Otherwise, I, I think that's it. Any questions? I don't see any. Anybody have any questions about the RFP right now? Um, you may not, and like as Sally said, until you get it in hand, which next week she'll be sending you the the draft, the template version of this, so that you can pour over it at your leisure. If you have any questions, you can type. Thing, the only thing I would like say, unmute what, yourself and um, ask your question. I would like to just say what you need to look at is the Network Nebraska procurement RFP. It's how many pages long? Um, combined, it's like over 40 pages. Mm -hmm. So, so far we've got requests from Peggy and Tanya, and I'll send those out to you right after this meeting this afternoon. Anyone else on the call today's webinar, uh, it's all public documentation. I'm happy to share that with you while you're trying to decide, do I go this pathway, this pathway, or both? Um, no problem with us sharing that, and mm -hmm. it gives you you know, all the legal terms and conditions that companies are being held to on behalf of anyone who's in our RFP. I, again, I, I encourage you to do both, please. Um, we, uh, we are here to help you. Um, Tom is a great consultant. I wouldn't call him first related to if you're doing your own library individual RFP, but if you feel you need to, then I guess I know he'll accept it and he'll be <laughs> gracious and, and talk to you, but it would probably be Krista or myself that you would want to visit with, and primarily me with the RFP, or if you're looking at category two and equipment, and uh, but I think Krista could probably answer some of those questions too, and uh, E-rate is all hers, so. All right, I, I, don't I might be able questions. to answer a question, but that's it. <laughs> Doesn't look like anybody has any questions about it right now. All right, thank you. All right, I'm gonna pull back presenter control to my screen again. There it goes. 
And what I am going to do now is I'm going to show you the first form in the um, there we go. E-rate process, uh, the first form you will be submitting after you have your RFP ready. Um, this is key. You're going to need to do the RFP first and have it ready to upload and include when you submit this uh, 470, um, which is the first form in the E-rate process. So you do that first and then we'll do, you'll do this. But I'm going to show you here just a step-by-step -step screenshots of what it will look like, just so you can see in a demo what you will be encountering. When we do, when you are ready to do this if you've never done one before if you want assistance i can help you with it i helped many libraries um doing actually and i mentioned this on monday too doing a go to webinar session just like this where i set up a session just for us just for me and you and you share your screen and i can see exactly what you're doing and guide you through the whole form step by step i spent hours and hours on online with libraries um many of our libraries help them do that um that's my job to make sure you get the form submitted so just a reminder from monday this is done through epic the e-rate productivity center and that's the main url to get to it um and we have a lot of training and other things yes sorry yeah Mute. <laughs> No? Okay. Um, a lot of training and videos, uh, just a reminder too, for you to see how this is done as well, um, in addition to what I'm going to show you um, right now, which is my screenshots of um, how to go through the process. So this form that you're submitting is called the 470. It's the first form in the E-rate process where you are describing the services you're looking for, and um, this is the official name for it, description of services requested and certification. This opens up that competitive bidding process officially um, of, for when, and then the companies will reach out to you um, and you just let them know everything you need. Um, a lot of this detail will be in your RFP. You'll notice that you know we've got this big RFP with because this is a big construction project potentially, lots of detail needed. The 470 itself does not give you a lot of spots to detail all of that out that Holly just showed you. That's why you do that extra document. Then you do the 470 to officially submit it into E-Rate for their discount of um, funding. So once you have logged into your um, Epic account <laughs> um, on your main landing page when you first get logged in. I showed you how to do that on Monday's session, so look for that one. Um, right at the top here is links to all the different forms in the process. We're just going to look at the 470 today. So you just click on FCC Form 470, and it brings you right into it, bringing in your library's information, basic info. And the first thing you do is give it a nickname. You name this particular form. Um, basically, just something for you to track it and know which one it is, especially when you're doing E-rate e -rate funding years um, and paperwork and forms you need to do will cross each other <laughs> in time timeline, time-wise. You may be working on things for 2021 at the same time as you're doing 2022, and you need to be able to track which one is which. So um, you give it a nickname just to help you track it. Uh, I will also mention here as I'm going through these screenshots, you'll notice it says here funding year 2021 at the top. Because um, these are the, the beginning of this is screenshots I took when we did this last year. Um, most of the form is still the same. I just went through this the whole form yesterday to test to check it all. There will be um, farther on. There'll be one. They have updated some of the form um, for 2022. So um, we'll see when we get to those screenshots that this will change. Just saying, it's funding year 2022, and those are the think parts that are different this year. Um, ideally, it's supposed to make it easier, less confusing. We'll see how it goes. It's a test. Um, but uh, don't worry about that. It says 2021, and you're actually applying for 2022. This is exactly what it looks like still for this year. So you give yourself a form a nickname. Uh, something also to be aware of, there is this discard form button here. Uh, if you decide that the form, you've done something wrong, or you want to start over, or um, you got distracted and, and you know went off and you want to do a new one, this is where you can discard a form. There is a section up here at the top of your screen called Tasks. Whenever you start a form, as soon as you get to this screen, it immediately has created this as you're working on a form. You haven't even put any information in at all yet it's already tracking that you have one in here and it will start nudging you repeatedly like once a week with an email the system will say hey you have this form to work on you have this form to work on if you've actually decided that wasn't the good form i've started a whole second one that is correct you want to stop getting those reminders you can just go into it in your tasks and discard it that's deleting and get rid of the form so you don't have those reminders keep coming to you so you can always clean up that task section 
Um, over on the right here, you've got save and share or save and continue. Um, always use save and continue. Save and share is mainly for larger organizations that have multiple people who handle their E-rate. Uh, one person does the form, someone else is allowed to submit it and officially sign off on it. Doesn't apply to any, any of you guys um, when you're just doing this on your own, so you just do save and continue. Next screen is just confirmation of your library. You're a library, you're a public library. Um, there is this build entity number. I mentioned that on Monday, that's the num number that is specific to your library that sometimes um, E-Rate will ask about. You can see you've also got your discard form here button that will be throughout the whole thing. And starting now, you have a back button too. So if you get farther along the form, realize you did something wrong, you need to change something, you always can go back, back, back. And save and continue. Uh, next screen, uh, consultants. Consultants, there are p companies you can hire to help you do your application. That's also for big systems, <laughs> big library systems. Uh, you don't pay me to help you with this, so that's not me. <laughs> um, and, oh, we have a question. If the build entity email is wrong, how do you fix it? Ah, um, if the email address is wrong, I can actually, the, this, depending, it depends. If the email is where, okay, so the email that is going that, is, that you assert currently in your E-rate account is not the correct one. What we would do is set up a um, new user in the library's account and then switch the control to that new user. Um, to log in to the Epic, it, your email address is your login, but you can have multiple people in the library's account, multiple profile individuals, and we just need to create a whole second thing, second person and then we'll switch the um, administrator control to that person. Um, if you, yours is uh, not doing what it's supposed to, Tanya, let mom shoot me an email and I will help you work on making sure we get that switch and going to the right person. All right, so uh, we do here then say, are you the main contact person? Um, yes or no, generally yes, it's you submitting the form. And as soon as you click yes, it automatically pops in your um, name, email, and phone number. Um, also notice the top here, we now have a bar that's going to move along the top here showing you where you are in the form step by step so you can see how you're progressing through the form. So you just confirm you the contact, save and continue. And uh, this is where you can choose what type of service we are going to be requesting. In, on a 470, you can do a category one just for your basic internet, category two, all that equipment that you may need to update, or you can do a 470 that covers both. Um, for this, I'm gonna show you doing both, because we're gonna do a little of each, um, to do uh, fiber special construction. And um, I'll also clarify here right now too, this particular demo that I'm doing right here now is specifically for doing special construction application. And so I'm gonna be talking about it all and related to that. I do a general E-rate training later in the fall um, that will have a more generic kind of demo as well. So if you also attend that one at some point, you'll notice that it's going to have some different instructions. This one I am focusing on what you all need to know for doing our fiber special construction. So we're going to do both. We've checked both of these boxes and we save and continue. Um, is there an RFP? Yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do here. So um, we say yes. And then this is where you upload your RFP. So you have to have that document done and ready to go. All the specifics filled out for your library based on that template that um, Holly's gonna send to you and work with you on. You can click on the upload button and then it will open up wherever you have documents on your computer. And you can then choose that, click on it, click on open and it dumps it, pops it right into there. Um, you can also do a drag and drop. You see it says drop file here was there as well. So um, if you already know where it is, you can just separately open up wherever the folder is that you have it and click and drag it over there if you've ever done that with anything. Either way, whichever works for you, just to get the RFP in your 470. And then save and continue. And see, it's there. And then on the next screen, they want to know what um, what categories are is this RFP going to apply for 
uh, apply to. Um, and we're going to have it be for both because this is going to be for both our monthly because it's talking about that and any of our equipment that may be listed in there. So um, we check both those boxes so that it can be used when we go on and talk about the specifics that we want to ask for and save and continue. And now you can see, I'll point out here at the top, it has changed to funding year 2022. This is where they've changed how the form works from last year's application. Um, it's similar, but the idea was to take you more through a step-by-step -step and showing you what the options are every time. Um, previously is a little more kind of hidden, which one am I supposed to use for what? Um, I kind of like the new way, We'll see how it works in real practice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to add what they call service requests. You're asking for you're requesting e-rate discount on particular service. Service being the construction, the monthly internet cost, and service also being equipment. They just use that same term. Um, there's a box down here with a narrative where you can provide for further detail, as it says, and it gives some examples now of any reason why someone would be disqualified from applying, if they miss a deadline, like what we were talking about in the RFP, um, details and everything. Uh, as you saw the document that Holly showed, you don't really want to enter all of that into this box here. That's how we attach this separate document. All we'll put in here in the narrative is just CRFP because that's much easier. We got it all in there. Um, but to add your particular items to this 470, what you want to get a discount on, you click on the blue add new service request. And then it gives you two types of options. You are seeking bids for internet access and or data transmission or network equipment or maintenance operations under category one. We're gonna do the bids for internet access. So this is um, the fiber or your basic what you do. And when you click on that, it will open up a different new menu of, of subsections. So you can dig down and spe specifically talk about well, what kind of internet access. So because we've checked that first box, I seek bids for internet, this is what comes up. If we did I seek bids for category one, it would different list would come up. And we are going to start with the top one, which is for a data transmission. So basically any kind of um, uh, transmission that you can see here, fiber is mentioned in here. Um, they've got them all kind of um, bundled, don't, I'm not going to use the word bundled, gathered together in one um, category, whether you're doing fiber, non-fiber, DSL, copper satellite, whatever way you're going to be getting it, they just have it as one choice. You know, we are of course looking for the fiber option, but that's the one that we chose choose. And then it opens up a new choice. Are you looking for um, internet access, whether offered by one service provider or as a bundled package offered by one or more? or data plans or wireless adapters, air cards. Those are the two different types of internet connection. Um, data plans and air cards, you can see here, it's specifically only if you do not have an existing broadband connection. So that's only for very special cases where broadband is not available. You can use data plans and air cards. Um, so it doesn't usually come up because generally some sort of broadband is available in your community. Um, some of you have the reason we're going for fiber right now is it's broadband, but it's not that great. So we are choosing the top option for broadband. And then it will open up the information below where you put in your specifics about what you are looking for. Quantity is um, how many internet connections do you want to your building? Um, number of entities. Uh, this all is um, how many the locations is there. For all of you, it's a single library location, so it's just one. Um, it makes more sense when there's multiple ones, when you've got like a school district with multiple schools, they would have like three locations. Um, and then you need to put in what you are requesting for minimum and maximum speed, and if you want installation, activation, and initial configuration, which of course we do, because we're getting something new. So on the next thing here, I've entered in the information. Um, you just want one internet connection. You're a single entity. Yes, you would. please, we would like somebody to come and install it. And then our capacity here, I've got a minimum, and this is just, for example, minimum 25 megabits per second, maximum one gig. Um, I don't know if we got anybody that got up to that much. Tom or Holly, do you know when we did last year, did anybody get up to a gig from any of these providers? We, um, we have one who did. Oh, um, okay. So, and we'll, we'll reveal shortly. 
Okay. <laughs> Everybody else. Because <laughs> yeah, the max I, capacity I, I here can go up far higher than one gig. If you when you open up that those pull them those menus there, you'll see it goes up to I don't know 100. I can't remember what, what the maximum is, but it's it's crazy high. Um, is one you think be the highest we should we need to put in, or should we recommend higher? I, I think we have some that are above a gig. Yeah, are, the one that we'll be talking about. Yeah. Beatrice. <laughs> Beatrice. The other yeah. rural libraries, <laughs> 100 to 500 over the term of this contract Three. would mm -hmm. probably be very appropriate. Three years. And yeah. That's yeah. Getting now. Yeah. They'll be growing into 500 but, megabytes. Yeah. Yeah, because they um, and they're also the well, the contract listed as um, the different layout, um, speeds so they can have it scalable. They can ask for it to go up. Yeah, this is know. only the min and the max. Yeah, and then the cost, to 500. cost proposal will have other increments possible. So. Everything in between, yeah. And yeah. that's the one thing important about the 472 is this is kind of like your wish list. You don't want to limit yourself. You want to give yourself as much wiggle room as possible. So even though, as we said, most of our libraries were getting the 100 to 500 megabits, say you're looking for up to one gig. You never know. It might be out there. You might get it as one did. But something higher, it doesn't matter. As long as what you end up with falls between these two minimum and maximums, you're good for E-rate. So think big here. And then in the end, you'll we'll put in when we do, when you get your contract with the company, what they ended up with giving you. Uh, and you can see here it also does default checking here is the RFP that applies which was that RFP that we submitted and then um, if you say in here you've got something new save and create another request or save request if you save and create another it just makes a duplicate of this one so you don't want to do that you want to do save request and when you do save request pops you back to that screen we started at and now we've got a little table started here with the particular item that we just entered with all the basics um, now I'm going to add another one that will add our least lit fiber and dark fiber, which we know dark, not a lot of that available, but this is where you want to make sure you put this in as an option, as a request as well, so you have all your bases covered for what type of connection you might get. So um, we're still doing the internet access or data transmission, but we are choosing the third option, purchase data transmission service only that does not include internet access and that's okay because we've got that on the other request and you see here it is talking about the dark fiber strands or capacity over a least lit network so this is where you grab those as you put those in here for as a potential connection and you see this is a little different Sorry, it's kind of tiny when I'm just showing you the whole page here, but it's very similar to that first one. How many connections do you want for each one? Um, what your capacity is? Um, it's all the same entities served. It's just there's your dark, there's your lit, um, lit. And you fill these in the same way. You want one connection. Um, I did the same 25 and one. So you just do the same as you did in the previous one, but just for this, uh, the lit and dark, or dark and lit fiber. Um, your number of entities served is down here. They just kind of rearranged where the same questions just rearranged a little bit and yes we would like somebody to please install it thank you and um, your RFP is automatically included so let me save this request and then there you'll see because we had two things that kind of it added two items to our category one up there so there we've kind of put in every a request for every type of connection we might possibly have um, quotes sent to us about and then down here in the narrative, uh, just to make sure they really know, even though it says here we've associated the request for proposals and they're attached in there, just to you know, um, put the push the point home, see RFP in the narrative as well. So they know it's in there. I attached an RFP. Look at that for all the details. Uh, uh, generally, we're not doing installment payment plans for this since we're getting an E-rate discount and Public Service Commission money, so you would say, no, we're not looking for an installment payment plan. You do have to answer that question. Um, and then here we save and continue. And now, because we had checked both Category 1 and Category 2 that we were going to be applying for, it gives us the option to start a Category 2. Uh, and this is for the, all that equipment. Works similar, the same way to Category 1, add a new service request. But now this talks about it's for equipment or for the basic, basic maintenance on that equipment. And then um, the operations that having someone, uh, the company do this all for you. So we're gonna start with the equipment you might do. And then there's gonna be, this is for your internal connections is what they call it, everything physically in the building that makes the internet work. 
and there's this big pull um, pop-up menu that lists all those different things that was mentioned on the RFP that um, Holly showed. Your antennas, your cabling, firewall, racks, <laughs> routers, switches, et cetera, et cetera. So all those same things that are in your RFP, you have to specifically in the 470 also itemize them out here to let E-Rate know within their system, these are the individual things we would like an E-Rate discount on. So I chose cabling as this first example. Um, how many feet of cable you need? I don't know if a thousand is a good number. I just do that as a, as a guess. Um, you would find out uh, from talking to someone how many feet of cable we need. Um, there's a manufacturer choice. You do not have to choose a manufacturer or specify one. You can just say whoever. Um, but if you know there's a specific one or if you're, you've heard from your company you might be working with, we like to work with this one, you can choose. Note it says whatever company name or equivalent. When you open up this pull down, it's going to always say or equivalent or equivalent um, because you don't want to limit to just we can only get 3Com. Because then if they decide for some reason, you know, six months from now when they actually do the construction, oh, that brand's not available and you do something else and you haven't said or equivalent, you're out of luck. You don't get the E-rate. That's how specific it can be. So by default, it doesn't even let you do that. It always says or equivalent. <clears throat> You're one entity. Yes, we want someone to install our cables. Yep, here's the RFP is attached. Now something new they added here, which I love. An extra new box here. Please select this option if you'd like to create an accompanying category to basic maintenance of internal connections. That's that BMIC request for this internal connections request. Basic maintenance and the equipment itself and the basic maintenance of, this, of it, which is the um, installing it, doing upgrades, um, uh, system updates, whatever you need to do, is a separate request. And many times people forgot and never did that second part, and then were not able to get an E-rate discount when someone had to come in and do, you know, a year from now, oh, we have to replace the cable because, unfortunately, yes, a squirrel did chew through it, <laughs> um, and they forgot. So now they've made it a little box here, automatically check that, and it just fills in for you everything you put in the top part about your equipment, and then it's automatically created a request for that. And you'll see here now when I hit save request, didn't just put one op item in there, it put two. The cable itself and the basic maintenance of that cable all in one shot. Love that. Um, now we have other equipment we're gonna ask for, as you saw on the RFP, uh, your switches, your wireless access points, et cetera, et cetera. And you just go through, I'm not gonna show doing every single one of those right now, um, but you do the same process for each one of them, just choosing them from that list of equipment, adding a new service request, putting it in, adding a new service request, back and forth, back and forth, so you have them all listed. Um, here I, can, I show you where I've done that for our routers. Um, wireless access points, three wireless access points, and switches. And you just keep going to have them all listed here. As you can see, I added basic maintenance for all of them as well to make sure. So just go back and forth, back and forth, you got them all there. Double check, just make sure you add here CRFP again down at the bottom, and then we save and continue. Um, and now we're back to the 2021. So that was the big changes with how you add all that in. I think it's a lot slicker and easier. We'll see. Uh, if you have a technical contact person, you want to tell them, talk to them instead of me about all the technical parts, you can put that in here. If it's just you, you could say no. But if you do have someone, you can say yes. And you can, um, if they don't need their own Epic account, they probably don't, you can enter their details manually and just put in their name, phone number, and email address so that they know. I don't know as a library director all the techie stuff, but Luke, who's my tech guy, he knows. Save and continue. Um, are there any state or local requirements? You'd have to know that if there are any and say yes or no. Uh, for this demo here, I just said no. Um, and now, instead of saying continue, we've entered all of the information into the form. And we can now review our um, Form 470. Uh, when you click that button, it just says, when it's ready, a task will become available to complete your certification. That's signing off on this form. And that's up here in your tasks. So what it's doing now is it is sending this information to USAP, to their servers, and creating all the information into a form and giving you a uh, PDF that you can look at. This can take a few minutes. And I mean minutes, like two, three, you know, 60 seconds, 120 seconds. You may have to wait till you see something come up in your tasks. Um, click up here in the blue box on tasks and see if there is something here. 
most likely the first time you do that, you won't see anything. And you just gotta wait, uh, refresh your page, maybe hit tasks again. It does take some actual time for that to process to go through, but eventually you will have something that says certify FCC Form 470. And I'll mention here while I'm showing this, these here that say create and create, these are forms that I have started but never finished. These are the ones that are kind of floating around there and they keep reminding me of, and I wanna go in and do that discard form button to clear them out because I don't really need them anymore. This is my the top one that I wanna certify is my good 470. This other 470 was when I started and then did wrong, or gave up on. So what you will do is click on the one to certify, and there will be a link here that you can click on to open up a PDF. You notice over here on the right, right now, there is a continue to certification button, but it's not dark blue like our buttons have been before. That's because you have to check in this box to certify that the PDF is correct. Um, you don't have to look at the PDF if you don't want to, but if you'd like to double check your work, you can. If you click on it, it just opens it up, and then whatever you use, this is my Adobe Acrobat. So it's the same information I entered just in a PDF version. Um, basic information about the library, followed by our category one requests, then our category two requests, our entity information, technical contact, all of that is there. You can to save and print this out if you want to, but I don't recommend doing that right now. After the form is totally submitted and certified, you can get a final version of it showing the actual date and time you actually submitted. So that's the final one you want. This is just to look at on your screen and make sure everything looks okay. You'll notice you got your back button. If something does need to be changed, you can still go back and, and change it if you want to but we're happy with it. We check the box and we continue to certification. You do not send for certification, even though it sounds like that would make sense. <laughs> That's another thing where it sends it to someone else who would be in your account for bigger organizations of multiple people working on E-rate. Not what we're doing here, you're doing all of this. So you continue to certification, do it yourself. It confirms, are you sure you wanna do that? Once you do this, you can't go back and change anything. And these are your certifications. That's so you can see the whole thing. Yeah, it's huge. Um, but I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see there's just all these little boxes. This is all the legalese you have to agree to. Um, you can you feel free to read through it all if you want to. It just says you are allowed, you're um, authorized to do this, you're gonna follow all the rules, et cetera, et cetera. You have to check every single box here. You'll notice here also, behind the screen here, the there's a blue certified button in the lower right. It's kind of grayed out, light blue right now, until you check all those boxes, then it turns dark blue and you can actually click on it. So you've got to check every single box, click the blue button, then it pops up with this con the scary confirmation, false statements on this form may result in civil liability and or criminal prosecution. Just don't do anything illegal. <laughs> uh, so you say yes, you do want to submit it. And then it's done, it is submitted. Now, if you want to double check and make sure it's gone through, Back on your landing page, when you first log in, at the very bottom, you scroll down, and I showed you this on Monday too, there's the area where you can look up your forms that you've submitted, anything. Um, it goes back, you can actually look back as far as 2016 in year, so you just choose the form type, funding year, and it will bring up the different ones you have. Here you can see I've got an in my incomplete one, but once it's certified, it will say certified as the status, and that you know it's done, it's actually been received at USAC at E-Rate. You can click on the blue nickname, the number here, to open up the full um, form if you want to. Um, you can print this out. Um, you can also, through there, get a PDF of it. They originally have, the, like I said, the final PDF, which actually shows um, the date and time that you submitted if you want your own paper version of this. Uh, you will also receive an email Note in your well, a notification in your news feed within the Epic system confirming that they have received it. Um, you can use this to make changes. Some certain things can be changed. They call them ministerial and clerical errors, typos, things like that. You can't add more items to this form after the fact, but you can submit a second form 70 if you needed to. Um, this also gives you your allowable contract date, which Tom had mentioned that 28 days. You have to wait 28 days after the 470 before you can go and make your decision about who you're gonna go with and you know, open up those bids and make your choices and then submit the 471 telling you right here's who we've picked. Um, it's in your news um, here. 
you can click on news and get it and here is where it shows you that date so you have a specific date it doesn't make you know so you don't have to do the math yourself and figure out what is 28 days from today it will tell you right there that is when the earliest date that you can open up those bids and just to show you here quickly this is the first form 470 after this you will do a 471 that will be in the spring when you've gotten your bids and you're deciding who you're going to go with um, when, when the, the, there's a specific time frame, you can do that. Then you'll do a 46 telling you, Zach, we want our, we would like our money after you've been approved. And then you decide about invoicing. Are you going to get a discount on your bills or are you going to get um, a reimbursement after the fact? And all this is for later. Today, we're just talking about getting the process started with a 470. Just wanted you to know that there are three more steps after this that will go through. And that's what I will help you with to make sure you get through all of them. Any questions about the 470 or anything that I just went through? Went through that pretty quickly because we are running short on our time here right now. Um, if you do have any questions, go ahead and type them in, unmute yourself. I see a question here already from Christy. Do we fill out two 470s, one fishing for fiber and two continuing basic internet that we have currently? Um, no, you don't have to. Um, you can do one 470, and that first request that I did that was just for any type of connection, that would cover you for your current internet that you have, and then that extra one will also cover you for new laced lit fiber or potentially available dark fiber. Um, so you can do this all as one big 470, and then everything is just in one application. If you want to, though, you can separate it out for your own mental keeping track of things and do for two of them if you want to one just for keeping my current one going and one that has to do with all my special construction related potential work that might be done up to you if you want to but you don't have to any other questions like I said, I do also do a full E-rate workshop um, later in the fall. You'll see announcements about that if you want to know like more about the general everything E-rate. Today we're talking specifically kind of mini E-rate and specifically how it works for special construction. I don't see any more questions coming in, so onto the cost. Now we are getting close to our end time. Um, it's 11.55, so we will probably go over to get through everything. Um, we will keep going and recording for the whole time. Uh, so if you do need to leave because you didn't, you only allotted up till noon for this, noon central time, that's fine. Um, but please do try and stick around so we can go through the rest of this and you can ask any other questions you have. Um, if you have questions you do want to have answered um, and that you do need to leave, get them into the question section here and we'll make sure we answer them and um, within the session here and uh, we will email you if you have to leave. Um, Oh, we do, okay, so Tanya wants to know, were you going to tell us what the percent of discount, like what your discount percentage is for your library? Is that what you mean? Yes, I actually sent that. There was a spreadsheet attached to the email I sent with a recording from Monday's session that has mm -hmm. all of your libraries listed there and telling you what your E-rate discount is. I'll send it to you. I could look that up again if you want to, but um, I think let's go on to uh, the next thing, this, the costs. Holly and Tom. So, next slide. Yeah, next slide. We're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just, it's just a cover slide. We can keep going. I have. Um, so I have had a number of people call me and just ask, and they're concerned about going forward with this, even just to talk to the administration that you know who they're they report to in the communities as to, well, what is this going to cost? Um, so uh, I basically just put the full cost, so this would be the cost of the uh, one-time cost for fiber uh, that is uh, listed there, just the fiber, and then the uh, amount of, um, uh, would it be linear feet that were um, required to go from the node where the fiber began to the library and then the speed. 
And I don't know if you heard, but basically the last library six is Beatrice Public Library. And so they are the gigabit and they are the longest distance. And they actually had, didn't have much interaction with um, um, myself or with the Library Commission. Uh, they chose to go with Network Nebraska and uh, they have been working with ESU five. five. Who handled the whole process right. actually. I visited briefly with the library director yesterday and she said, I just wrote a little checkout for, you know, <laughs> all of this happening because they are at 100%. So they did not pay uh, for anything for the, uh, install, you know, the fiber installation. So I just, this is really, there's not a lot of conversation here. What I want to do is, though, is, is send you this slide maybe next week, Wednesday, too, but I'm going to add some more information to it. So it might be more, um, but I, I don't really want to identify all the libraries. I don't know if they want people to know that. Um, Beatrice didn't mind. I asked her. Um, but uh, but we'll just call them library one through six, and you know who six is. So uh, do, does anybody have any questions about this? or? Oh, and also, if you see the asterisk, we do have one li library that's still waiting for a funding commitment decision letter. We don't anticipate any issue, but they are still waiting. It's just like what Becky mentioned earlier. Sometimes some of them just take more time for unknown reasons. Gets put right. to the bottom of the pile. Who knows? So <laughs> if there are no wrong questions, application, the it just isn't done yet. <laughs> and if there are no questions, in the interest of time, we, we certainly can keep moving on. This is Tom. Well, it's all three of us actually, but um, I think we've talked um, pretty well today about the category two options that they should be parallel to your procurement for fiber and Holly and, and Chris are great resources. Um, you all can elaborate on the ARPA discretionary funds for any post discount cost. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually, it was actually asked about that, if it could be used for that, and it, they said um, yes. Um, what this is, is and hopefully you've seen the announcements um, here at the Nebraska, uh, well, okay, ARPA is the um, American Rescue Plan Act, trillions of dollars out there, has been allotted to lots of agencies, and part of it was given to the Institute for Museum and Library Services, who provide funding to us as a state library agency. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission was given $2.4 million to use to help libraries in the state. We're using $1.4 million of that to start with as um, to give out as formula grants to libraries. Um, these are non-competitive grants, meaning um, you don't, it's not a, you submit an application and tell us what you're gonna do and you get evaluated and we decide to give you the money. This is money has been allotted to all of our libraries, all legally established libraries in the state, state-run institutions and tribal libraries are eligible for this. There's just a specific amount of money all of you are have, have had allotted. Uh, the minimum, is three thousand and seventy dollars, I think. It's off the top of my head, I should open it up. Um, plus um, an amount based on your um, service area, legal service area. Uh, go to that website, look for it. All you have to do is apply. Tell us you want the money. This is similar to your state aid money that we give you, um, but you do have to let us know you want it. So it's just a very short form saying, yes, I'm a library. Yes, please give me my money. We will um, immediately issue you the funds, and then you will need to respond back to us later when you start buying things or um, with invoices showing what you bought and a completion report letting us know what you spent it all on. So there is um, this money, it's already set for you, ready for you to get, you just need to ask for it. Every library has a cut of this money. Um, <clears throat> and that can be used for that extra bit of E-rate, you know, your E-rate covers for category two, only 80% of the cost, that extra 20, you can use this money to pay for that um, if you wanted to. There'll be two future grants coming later this month, also out of that ARPA money, the Youth Grants for Excellence that we do every year and the Library Improvement Grants. So look forward, those are competitive grants, the usual, tell us what your project is, we'll, then we'll have to evaluate and let you know. So look for those as well coming. But apply for your ARPA formula grants, they're for you, they're ready, just take the money, please. So we can use the ARPA for, to pay for anything that's not covered by the E-rate? 
Yes, and what it can be do, yes, and I assume you're asking about like the computers themselves or the Chromebooks or whatnot. Yeah, just because if we mm -hmm. hit, if we're at 80% on E-rate, the extra percentages should cover everything 100%, right? For the fiber special construction, for the special construction of the fiber, um, uh -huh. bringing that fiber connection to your library, if you're at 80%, yes, um, Public Service Commission will pay an extra 10, and then E-rate matches that 10. That's just for the construction. For the equipment that you might need to buy to upgrade um, and your monthly internet costs ongoing, you just get your discount and you're responsible for the extra 20% for those costs. So it's kind of, you okay. got to separate out the construction project and then the ongoing internet and any equipment you might need to update servers, routers, switches, that stuff. Okay. And that difference you can use, you can cover with this ARPA funding. Um, you can also buy the actual laptops and computers if you need to update those. That's something that E-Rate never covers, but ARPA funding can be used to um, do all of that if you want to. Um, on our website about the formula grants, we have a big list of all the different kinds of things that you can use the money for. This E-rate part is just one of many, many things. Go ahead, Dom. Okay, so next bullet is LB388, the Nebraska Broadband Bridge Grant uh, was passed by the legislature in this past session at the request of the governor and has created a grant fund for providers to do new telecommunications development across the state particularly in rural areas. There'll be $20 million over the next two years and it must be matched dollar per dollar by the provider or and or the municipality working together. So 40 million all of a sudden turns into 80 million. The reason we bring it up here is um, you may be going down the special construction route which pinpoints the library amidst the whole, all the city offices, et cetera, but what if your provider in your municipality applies for broadband bridge grants and gets awarded? So just be aware at the local level that this could be happening. It shouldn't take the place of the work that we're talking about today, but it may be supplemental. And it may be that your project with E-rate gets done prior to even the project that's being talked about in broad, broadband bridge or your municipality gets ignored altogether, meaning there's no interest in developing fiber to every residence and every business. That's a much larger project. But as library leaders in your community, uh, keep your ears open. If your uh, city council, village board, or others are uh, expressing interest in this brand new grant program, that I would bet that most city leaders are not even aware. So the PSC will start accepting applications as early as October. It's on an extremely fast track. The last time we saw anything like this was the governor's grants uh, that had to be done by December 2020 and indirectly benefited a number of libraries across the state. So again, it doesn't take the place, but just be aware that this could be happening and Maybe you decide not to go forward with fiber special construction. Maybe you'll get a gift from the city as part of these projects. So we never know. Um, next bullet, U.S. Treasury Capital Projects funding. We're waiting on final uh, instructions from Treasury and from the governor's office. But there's somewhere in the vicinity of 120 to 140 million that will be coming to our state for capital projects, which means uh, five-year project build-outs definitely can involve broadband, and we yet do not know what shape this is going to take, but it's one more iota of broadband construction that we hope will come into rural areas. And then the last one, ECF, uh, Chris has been very involved with that for libraries, uh, Nebraska schools, as of yesterday, uh, 57 applications were over $4 million, which is really, you know, a drop in the bucket out of the $7.1 billion. 
but that to schools? I'll let uh, Krista elaborate on libraries. Yeah, that $71.1 billion is for the whole country, not just for Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> it's what's available. Okay. <laughs> That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Um, yes, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, this is something I like to describe as E-rate adjacent. It's not a replacement or an expansion of E-rate, it's a whole separate thing. And uh, this is actually to expand your internet connection and service outside of the library. Something we've, I've always been very, and I've mentioned today, specific about is E-rate's not for the devices, it's just for inside your building, um, well, in your area if you have Wi-Fi that goes outside your walls, that's okay. Uh, the Emergency Connectivity Fund in response to the pandemic is part of, um, actually part of ARPA. It's a subset of, it's in that ARPA as well. And it's specifically for schools and libraries to buy devices, laptops, um, tablets, to loan out to their students in for schools and library patrons in need. People that do not have something available to them at home, do not have internet connection at home, you lend it out to them. Um, also for hotspots for them to bring that internet connection into their homes. So this is specifically for things that have to leave the library, not for use inside the building. So if you need to upgrade your computers that you use inside the building or that you're, you, you loan out to your pe you know, people using your library in the building, that's not what this money can be used for. It has to be for the purpose of loaning outside and taking home. It's for, up, um, this is part of closing the homework gap or the connectivity gap for remote education, or remote access to the services that are offered by schools for education and for libraries, whatever we do. Um, and that link there is a link that talks all about it and links to all the pages of where you can apply for that. It is being run by USAC, the same or people that run E-Rate because the FCC said, you guys know how to give out this kind of money, let's have you give out this stuff too. <laughs> so um, it does use a form 471, you will see that in there just like E-Rate, but it's the Emergency Connectivity Fund 471, not the E-Rate 471. You'll yeah. notice, go ahead. Application deadline imminent. Yes, yep, yep, and, and this is coming up quickly. The deadline to apply for the ECF is next Friday, August 13th. So if you want to get this, do it now. Look at it now. Um, maybe think about this right now. And then after this is done, think about the fiber because uh, next Friday is the deadline to apply. Um, last time I looked, which was yesterday, we have had 18 libraries apply um, and nine of them actually certified and completed. Some of them are in process. Um, plus this would be for doing maybe a hotspot lending program, a laptop lending program that you're you know, doing. Um, if you want help with this, reach out to me. I can help you. I did do a webinar about it as well. And on that link on our blog post, it links to my webinar about it. There's lots of training and information on the ECF website itself. Demos, a little 15 minute demo showing how to submit the form. Um, so uh, yes, if you want, if you're interested in doing that kind of thing, giving out laptops and hotspots to your users, apply for that. Next Friday, Friday the 13th is the deadline. Very good. And all right. Any questions you have, get them typed in. I see everybody is still here. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Type in your questions, unmute yourself, ask your questions. We will um, answer whatever you need right now. Anything else, Holly and Tom, um, with wrap up? No, we just really appreciate everybody who attended and um, we look forward to finding out what you uh, decide to do. Um, I may be following up and, and contacting you and uh, perhaps the others also, but I just kind of want to see what you're thinking and um, and hopefully there's something about this that appeals to you as far as uh, either looking to upgrade your equipment or uh, we are sure hoping fiber. And I, again, I'll send you an email next Wednesday. I, um, I'm going to update this uh, um, year one data with some more information. might be helpful for you to make decisions with your community about what you want to do. And we will send you also these slides, just like we did with Mondays, and recording of um, today's session. Um, I know, Holly, did you want to wait and send that next week, too? Or you want me to just go ahead and do that when I have it ready 
today. Well, or I think if you, if you have it ready today, we'll go ahead and send it. So if they if you have something fresh in your mind who are attending, then you can go take a look if you if you're not quite sure what was said. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll just keep pestering you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So sh most likely by the end of the day today, you will all have an email from me, um, just like you did on Mondays with the slides and a link to the recording for today. Don't see any questions. Anything you desperately need to ask us or want to mention right now? What are your thoughts on this? Yes, no. Are your communities already raring to go? All right, I think we'll wrap it up then. Uh, there is our contact information for all three of us. Uh, reach out with any questions. Look for an email from me today. Look for an email next week from Holly, and we'll help you work on this process. Get fiber to everybody. All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye.